Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. It's a fitting quotation to begin this story. The time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. Hamlet, William Shakespeare. And this is a story of the century in which he was born, the 16th. Young Will Shakespeare was an apprentice in his father's butcher shop. Queen Elizabeth ruled England. And Henry III presided over an uneasy France, torn apart by religious wars between the Huguenots and the Catholics. These were times bloodier than today, when no street was safe at night. Damn, it's the night guard. What matter? We have safe conduct on a dark night like this. You think these thieves in livery will stop to see them? You're right. They may even be Huguenots. If we can just reach that next corner unseen, we have a chance. Come! Ah! Oh, do not. What? I stepped on a pebble, my sword against the wall. Hand and deliver! Whoever you are! Run, run for your life, Denise. Oh, are we fired? Pay no heed. Fire! Oh, dear, I'm hit. Oh, they, 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 no, they've blown my whole side out to the right before they reload. Then at the end of the, the twisting lane to the left, a door. If God or love is good, behind it you may find refuge. <laughs> mystery drama, The Sire de Malatois' Door, was especially adapted from the Robert Louis Stevenson classic for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Wager. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You don't see many people putting salt in their beer nowadays. Not that there's anything wrong with salt on radishes or french fries, but man, not in the king of beers. Truth is, the only thing salt can do for Budweiser is make it salty. An unwise thing to do to the only beer in America that's beechwood aged. Unsalted Budweiser has become the most popular beer in the world. That's because in brewing Bud, 
the Budweiser Brewmaster goes all the way for a taste, a smoothness, a drinkability you'll find in no other beer at any price. And something else you can take without a grain of salt. The fact that when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Save a little and save a lot more at the Northwest Federal General Store. That's where you'll find a giant cracker barrel of gifts. Gifts for savers by famous makers we all know. The Sunbeam Hand Mixer, the Schick Style Dryer, a Presto Pressure Cooker and Wearing Blender. And they're all free or priced for special savings when you save $250 or more. See them all in our newspaper ads. And now you can save at three centers of interest in the great Northwest Territory, on Irving Park Road, on Dempster Street in Des Plaines, and now in Norwich in the Harlem Irving Plaza. So save where you get the highest interest rates allowed by law, and get free gifts, too, from the Cracker Barrel of Gifts, now at Northwest Federal Savings. But come in soon. Some styles and colors are limited. One gift per family, please. Offer good for a limited time only. Remember... It's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. The weapon you heard fired earlier was the arquebus, the precursor of the musket and our modern rifle. Not the weapon of the ordinary gentleman of this century whose sidearms were the rapier, a heavy weapon built two-edged for slicing and slashing with a sharp point for thrusting. Roger Chantivert and Denis de Beaulieu were only so armed when they were attacked, leaving Roger mortally wounded on the cobblestones of Chateau Landin. But let's begin with the other, Denis de Beaulieu. Earlier that same evening, as he is finishing a flagon of wine with the landlord of the Auberge Tête du Port. I beg your honor to stay off the streets of Chateau Vendon at dark. <laughs> Why, good host, it's scarcely dusk. What have I to fear? In the France of 1575, many things, thieves, cutthroats, and as bad as all of them, the guard itself. Most of all, the times. Half the city is still at war. What? With well, a truce proclaimed. Piece of paper. <laughs> but I have a safe conduct. It is also just a piece of paper. Well, landlord, I thank you for your kind concern. May this reward you sufficiently. Oh, the young gentleman is most generous. Well, come with me to the door and point out to me once the light lasts the way I must go to my friend Shawnee Dale's house. Well, it was out, was it not? Ah, that's the street. See you the church spire where the bell for evening mass is tolling? High on the hill to the right. Ah, the same. They mark you very close to it, the chateau. I've marked it before. What great lord lives there? The sire de Maletrois, owner of this fief, and lands beyond as far and further than the eye could reach. Oh, betide any man who should cross his path. Well, I'm not likely to since I'm here in your city only for the night. Pretty direct me on my way whilst I can still see to trace it. I'm sending you over the hill rather than around, for the lanes twist and turn enough to set one's head spinning. But if you steer between the church and the chateau, on the other side of the hill is a straight avenue, and three streets down, you'll find the Rue des Beaux-Arts. The chateau to my left, and as always, the church to my right, and <laughs> I pass between them. Ah, uh, just a moment. Don't worry about the dark. I'll not tarry for mass. I'd be too late anyway. You were a long time at confession, Blanche. Oui, monsieur. What can a young bird not even out of its nest and the maletrois at that have to confess that takes up so much time? Oh, please, Uncle. Have but, no but... fear, niece. I'm too good a Catholic to invade the confessional. And let me hand you to the coach. Thank you. Eh bien, Devon, to the chateau. But why so cheerful, my dove? Oh, not cheerful, but... Just... Tired. Tired? Of what, little one? Life? 
an arduous day. Pay a mayor's usual droning of the mass or a month of deception. Deception? The circles we travel in are small, Blanche. The least pebble dropped in the circumscribed pool of our life sets up waves. Among the Cognoscenti, there are no secrets such as... <gasps> oh, Andy, you're hitting me. I... Loosen it so that I may see what word my little bird has caught. I don't know what you mean. I am Please. afraid you do. But as always, those embroiled in scandal are the last to hear. In the Maritois family, that word does not exist, will not be allowed to exist. Open your hand or I will crush it open. He meant no harm. I should be the judge of that. Open. Oh. <laughs> A spilled paper. Badly crushed. A billet doux, no doubt. What are you going to do? Read it and decide. We're almost home. I... I think I shall defer my answer till we are behind the walls of Chateau Maletrois. Go to your quarters, mademoiselle. Send the maîtresse de chambre to me at once. But if only I could Obey just... Obey me. Nobody crosses my wishes. Oui, monsieur. As you desire... There, my you. There, my you. I hope so, this, Messiah. You are late. My niece wished to make confession, and she chose you. My mind might have been eased more quickly. Even for you, Messiah, how could I break the seal of confession? Uh, the question can be begged. It isn't necessary. I know now what is and what has to be done. I have instructions for you, the maîtresse de chambre, and send for my ironsmith immediately. There is much to be done before I set my trap and small time to accomplish it. But once I have caught my fly, he will dance to my tune or suffer the consequence. Darkness had dropped faster than I could have anticipated. As I climbed the twisting, meandering streets, I almost was sorry I'd not come by horseback. Fortunately, against the night sky, my twin stars stood outlined. The chateau and the church. Actually, approaching the church, the torches of those leaving mass were a beacon to lead me on. I even hesitated a moment at the sight of one beauty escorted to a carriage before passing on. And arriving at last on the downslope of the hill on the other side at my friend Jean Diver's lodgings... And one more for the road. I drink not for that, but to you, mon vieux. To both. Ah. Ah, God save me for any others and punish me if this should be a lie. But I swear by the winged archer himself or any comparable saint, if this were any other night, I would make no end of it. I understand. Where there's a lady... Ah, but such a lady. If I dared divulge all, but... Ah, listen. Midnight. She'll be here within the hour. I need no explanation, dear friend. I love the ladies as much as you. Indeed, on my way here, as I passed the church square, there was one who caught my oh, eye. Oh, damn our Breton weather. Here comes the rain again. Can we go? <laughs> At your heel, go by your side. Always. Ah, uh, we had so much to talk about. Except this special night. Forget it. Stay for your assignation. I'll find my way back to the inn. Our paths will cross soon again. Oh, damn the weather. I'll see you over the crest of the hill. From there, can you find your own way down? I found my way up. Aye, well enough, even by partial daylight. But in God's name, step quietly and carefully. Trust no one. Keep to yourself. No one. These are bad times when everything runs awry. You lead. I promise to be as careful as any church of the church to your left. Just follow this street we're on. Keep remembering to bear always to your right and downhill and you'll be at the inn within the quarter hour. But, move quietly. Au revoir, jean -Liver. Go in peace. As with you. Just one thing. Shh. Ah. Oh, my God. What 
matter? We have safe conduct. Oh, what a night like this. You think these thieves in livery will stop to look at them? You're right. If we can just reach the next corner, we may have a chance unseen. Come. Do not. What? I stepped on a pebble. My sword hit against the wall. Stand and deliver, whoever you are. It's the time. Run. Run for your life, Dennis. Oh, are we fire? Pay no heed. Run. Ah! Oh, dear. I'm hit. Was it? Too late. They, they've blown my whole side out. The left. The heart. I, I, I'm done for, Dennis. Run down the hill. Keep toward the side of Maltois Chateau. They may be less anxious to follow you there. Why? He's a power. More than that, I cannot say. Just try his door. treating with a pack of hounds that followed us. I fled from them, following the tortuous alleys, ever conscious of their footsteps after mine. Rushing down a lane scarce wide enough to accommodate myself, I suddenly found myself faced with a waist-high terrace, which I was about to leap, till some instinct, the rising moon, stayed me. Small wonder. On my side was a four-foot wall, but had I all leaped it, I would have dropped 40 feet to a craggy field of stone. I could hear the mob behind me. I was prepared to face them with sword and pointed, but the firearms I could not challenge. Tor! The left of me was a portico, and in its shadow a door. Any port in a storm. At least with something against my back, I could fight. I drew my sword, ducked into the shadows, and thrust my back against the door. And to my amazement, it gave way behind my weight opening to let me into possible safety. As it gave behind me, I heard the hound pack on my trail. I had thought to close the door, not quite in order to observe what had happened outside, but as I pushed gently, of a sudden, as, as though it was whisked from my hands, it thudded shut. From what pursued me, I was safe. That door could stand a battering ram. But a new and strange threat had developed. I had no desire to close the door all the way shut. It had been snatched from my hands with no control for me. I stood in a small hall with a staircase, rising out of the gloom. I turned to the door. It was as smooth as silk. No way of reopening it. I was trapped. My only way out was up the staircase before me. I... I had no choice. I started to mount, drawing my only weapon and wondering only if it could protect me and what I faced when I reached the top of those steps. For some reason, a premonition of unnamed terror ran like rat feet down my spine. What monstrous figure awaited Dennis de Beaulieu at the top of the steps? What swirling ghost from the underworld, or some other world, threatened his immortal soul? I can at least report some of that as we return shortly with Act Two. Three or one? That's the question when you catch the common cold. Then, take 12-hour contact. You need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three cold pills, one every four hours, or just one contact capsule. For up to 12 hours, continuous relief from sneezing, congestion, drips. The tiny time pills do it. For aches and fever, the others contain aspirin. Contact doesn't. Your cold, your choice. Six or three or one. Give your cold. To contact the number one cold medicine in the whole world. Six or three or one. Take contact only as directed. Blind and successful? Well, we're here to tell you. There are lots of us all over the country. We're blind, but we're just like you. 
I'm a senior clerk at the Downstate Medical Center. Part of my life just is getting up and going to work and performing certain functions on my job. I look at the NFB in the same respect that there's a commitment and an obligation. That to be able to give of yourself and to know that somewhere it will help others, and perhaps in turn that someone else who gives a little may in some way eventually help you. And when it all comes together, it can produce something, you know, very good and very big for the benefit of everyone. For further information, get in touch with your local affiliate of the National Federation of the Blind or contact me, Kenneth Jernigan, President, National Federation of the Blind, 218 Randolph Hotel Building, Des Moines, Iowa, 50309. This message presented as a public service by this station and the members of the National Federation of the Blind. did face Dennis de Beaulieu as he entered a large room of polished stone with arras-draped openings on three sides and two large windows on the fourth was a little old gentleman in a fur tippet seated by the fireplace in a high-backed chair. The great stone fireplace was between the windows and carved into it the arms of the Malatois. Seeing those arms, I was immensely eased and felt myself in good hands. Still winded from my running, we looked silently at each other for a second or two. In the brief exchange of glances, although the man was smiling and relaxed, I found myself tensing again. Something about him, the peaked eyebrows, the small... Strong eyes, so quaintly evil in expression. The line, the beautiful white hair, hung straight all about his head, like a saint. I am Anna, sire de Malétroit. Pray step in. I am indebted to you, sir. Pray pardon this unwarranted intrusion. Oh, not at all. I've been expecting you since I heard the church bell toll. Me? Messiah. <laughs> yes. I'm I'm afraid this is a double accident, so I'm I'm not the person you speak. Uh, really? <laughs> no, it seems you were expecting a visitor. Assuredly I was. But I can assure you that nothing was further from my thoughts or more contrary to my wishes than my arriving here. I am loath to let you labor under some misapprehension. No, tut, tut. If I do, surely it is the privilege of old age. And all will be straightened out in due time. Bring my guest a cup of spiced wine. You will join me, young man. Messiah, I... I have no desire to force you. I'm wondering about that. Behind the arras your servant has opened, I see what appears to be a small army of pikesmen and arquebusiers. I am old, as I have remarked. And these are perilous times. Even the nobility needs protection. The wine, sir. I accept your courtesy. The wine, don't bring it. If only to explain my presence satisfactorily and perhaps be accorded an explanation of why it failed to surprise you. In good time, in good time. I was visiting a friend, and on my way back to the inn, my friend accompanying me, we were set on by an armed band, Huguenots. Assassins, the guard, I know not. But that their intentions were violent and criminal is attested to by the fact that my friend was shot and killed. I, I fled with them in hot pursuit. Unfortunately, picking this cul de sac, I saw your door and fought with my back against it to be able to make some fight for my life. But as I leaned against it, it opened with my weight. And I gladly entered to put it between myself and the assassins who would have killed and robbed me also. A pretty story. You don't believe me? <laughs> Does it matter so much after all? Wait, nevertheless, that is what happened. Once they had searched without finding me, I would have left, but your door... Ah, yes, 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 my door. A little piece of ingenuity. No question of that. It fled from my hand as if someone had pulled it shut from the outside. And I could find no means of opening it from the inside. Ah, yes. Most ingenious, most ingenious. A hospitable fancy. Hospitable? To be sure. 
You arrived uninvited, but believe me, very welcome. You persist in error, sir. There can be no question between you and me. I am a stranger in this countryside. My name is Denis de Marzeau de Beaulieu. If you see me at your house, it is only as I have told you. My young friend, you will permit me to have my own ideas on that subject. They probably differ from yours at the present moment, but time will show which of us is in the right. Ah, here comes our wine. Let us enjoy it while the heat is still in it. We sat in silence while the servant served the wine and left. Again, I saw the armed men beyond the arras. I was conscious in the silence now of voices. One male and one female hurriedly gabbling as if in prayer behind the third arras. Meanwhile, the old gentleman surveyed me over the rim of his cup from head to foot. I was convinced I was dealing with a lunatic. And a dangerous one. I could stand it no longer. I got to my feet, clapping my hat on my head. You haven't finished your wine. Nor do I intend to. This is sheer madness. If you're in your wits for all your offered hospitality, you affront me grossly. Oh, dear, dear, dear. My conscience is clear. You've made a fool of me since the first moment. I'm leaving. And if I cannot make my way out in a more decent fashion, I'll hack your door in pieces with my sword. Get down, you rogue. And listen to me. Do you fancy that when I had that little contrivance made for the door, I stopped short at that? I've already seen your small army behind the arras armed to the teeth. Exactly. So if you prefer to be bound hand and foot until your bones ache, make one move to depart. If you choose to remain free, agreeably conversing with an aging gentleman, why then, resume your seat... Finish your wine in peace, and God be with you. So, I'm a prisoner. I state the facts. Now, let us finish the wine before it is cold. It serves to make the waiting more agreeable. But what? What are we waiting for? Uh, you entered from one Alice covered off. You have seen that the main house lies behind the second. We are waiting for what is taking place behind the third. Yes, but what? For a lady to make up her mind. Perhaps the longest wait a man can endure. I would for so days, mon brave. Speak up. It passes the time. Again we sat facing each other, the sire relaxed, patient, but for all his tiny stature and age, forbidding. For myself, I found myself down the wine at the gulp, almost choking on it as my throat tightened with some unknown dread. And I faced battle with less fear in my heart than I felt in this bewildering game whose purpose I knew not. A nightmare of nightmares. I turned to the arrows as if by staring at it hard enough. I could divine what was happening behind it. Daughter, in the name of the Lord Almighty, will you truly confess and admit to your sins? I tell you, Père Mayo, I have not sinned. You have lusted after men, young men who feast their eyes on you. Oh, can I? Who held here in the chateau a virtual prisoner since my father and mother died? You chose the most sinful place of all. Before the altar at the Holy Mass. But it is the only time I leave these walls. If I lift my eyes to look at the world outside, is that a sin? You have done more than look. You know the sire intercepted a communication to you from some man today. What was his name? I, I know not. Are you sure? But I lie to you, my father. Sin leads to sin. I can look in your eyes and tell you know his name. Even if I did, I would not tell you. Or the sire? Nor my uncle. I know how cruel he can be. How cruel both of us can be to save your immortal soul. Would you prefer we found the answer with a thumbscrew or the iron bolt? No, you would not. My uncle would not. Do not be too sure. <laughs> the honor of the Maltois name has never been sullied. As the last of the line, save yourself. The sire will never permit it to be. The name of the young man that passed you the note? No. I have done naught to feel shame for. 
Nor if there were such a cavalier, neither is he. The note, I cannot deny, it exists. But everything else is your foul imagination and my uncle's. I will not let you harm an innocent man because of who I am. So be it. I commiserate with you, my daughter, in the church. You have brought your punishment upon your own head. I go to inform your uncle. The silence between Miss Fowler, Malefroy, and myself, broken only by the intriguing murmur of voices behind the arras whose words could not be heard, had become intolerable. I was just about to speak when the third arras was pushed aside. The tall priest, his brows knitted in anger, his cool face set doggedly, came into the room. He stopped briefly in surprise, seeing me, favoring me with a long, keen stare, then crossed to the side, stopping his voice. I could scarce hear his words. Is she in better spirit, Father? I think she is more tractable, more resigned. David Beaulieu, this is my père familial, attached to my family. Père Mayou, le Mazou de Beaulieu, let us together repair to the chapel to meet with my niece and settle our affairs once and for all. Decency required, I offer my arm to the Sao de Maletois, who accepted it without question and limped with me along with the priest's vigorous drive. Through the arras, we entered a small chapel, pierced by many little windows shaped like stars. On the steps of the altar knelt an incredibly beautiful young girl, dressed with pride. I have brought a friend to see you, my child. Uh, turn around and give him your pretty hand. It is good to be devout, but necessary to be polite, my niece. Uncle, please, don't embarrass me any more. Whatever you ask of me, I will do. Only one thing I will resist to my dying breath. I will not tell you the young man's name. He is innocent of any wrongdoing. Pierre Milo has threatened me with a thumbscrew and a boot. Mayhap in my agony, you could force his name from me. Fortunately, oh, my fair, that is no longer necessary. We have the young man here. What? I ask you to be polite and turn around and give him your hand. From the moment we had entered, I held my breath. The setting was only too obvious. The bride awaiting the groom. It was not hard to realize that I must be cast in that role. I could scarce believe what was happening to me and was damned if I would be forced into a captivity I neither deserved nor would endure. Until the girl herself turned to me and said, That's not the man. Uncle, that is not the man. <laughs> of course not. I expected as much. It was so unfortunate that you could not remember his name. I swear I have never seen this gentleman before. I am distressed to hear it. But it is never too late to begin. Mm. Mm. I had little more acquaintance with my own late lady before I married her, which proves that these impromptu marriages often work for the best in the long run. Marriage? Miss Hyle, I strenuously object to being like oh, Of course, of course. Every man is spirit, Mike. The bridegroom has a right to have a voice in the matter. I will give you until dawn to make up for lost time till we proceed with the ceremony. Well, here's not so pretty a state of affairs. And the word affair is strictly used. For evidently, the remorseless sire de Malatois is convinced that his niece has brought the threat of dishonor on his name. A threat we might treat more lightly today, but 400 years ago, one lived by different standards. And the punishment for overstepping rules was more disastrous. A woman's virtue, if profaned, meant instant an unpleasant death. I'll return shortly with Act Three. Inside 
No, I mean your Culligan man may be calling on you soon. I'll show you how it goes. Knock, knock. Who's there? Culligan man. Culligan man who? No, look, this isn't a game. You know Culligan, the worldwide water conditioning people? Yes. Well, the Culligan man is your local water expert right here to solve your water problem. How do I know if I have water problems? Uh, Look at it this way. If we didn't have hard water here or some kind of water problem, then the Culligan man wouldn't even be here, would he? So, you know what to say when the Culligan Man knocks? Yes, and I know what to say if he doesn't, too. What? Well, Culligan Man! Well, I can't knock that. Want to try Culligan soft water without buying? Now you can rent a Culligan water softener for as little as $5.50 a month. For complete details on how you can rent a Culligan, pick up your phone and say... Hey, Culligan Man! This is WBBM Chicago. In the small chapel in the Malatois Chateau, the light flickers vagrantly across the faces of the four who stand there. Shadowed, the Saturnine priest belies his garments, looking like some vulpine devil. As the light plays across the sire's face, that comically evil smile seems even more mocking. As for Dennis and Blanche, the one is white with astonishment. The girl... Blushing with embarrassment. So, you cannot be an earnest. Indeed, I can. A man. I declare before God I will stab myself rather than be forced on that poor young man. I assure you, you will not have the opportunity. Oh, oh my uncle, pity me. There isn't a woman alive in France that would not rather die than have such a marriage forced upon her. <laughs> is it possible that you do not believe me? That you still think this is the man? Frankly, I do. But let me explain to you once and for all, Blanche de Maletrois, that when you took it into your head to dishonor my family and the name that I have borne, you forfeited any right to question my designs or even to look me in the face. Oh, but Michael, if you'll only Not listen... Not one word more. <laughs> it is my duty to see you married at once. Out of pure goodwill... I have tried to find your own gallant for you, and I believe I have succeeded. But if I have not, I care not one jack straw. So let me recommend that you be polite to our young friend, for, damn me upon my word, your next groom may be less appetizing. I have watched and listened to all this in puzzled silence. And silence for another reason. In two short minutes, watching the emotions that crossed her exquisite face, I felt I had come to know this girl. Her capacity for love, her tenderness, her bravery. And no, did I say? More than that. Admire, repeat, I love her for all she was. I was already jealous of her unknown cavalier. But that lady had spirit as well, I was seen to discover, as the heiress closed behind her uncle and the priest. And she whirled upon me with flashing eyes. Now, what, sir, may be the meaning of all of this? For well, Lord knows, this house seems to be full of mad people. Do you count me one of them? Oh, I did not mean that. Good. For well, I can tell you, I am enough in my wits to see that my uncle and yourself have made some monstrous bargain between them. Did you think I'm engaged in some point without old devil out there? You're, you're beyond your wits. 
I've no bed to marry with you, nor would I have if you asked me. I'm as much a prisoner in this house as you appear to be. And pray, how came you here? I was on my way from Paris to join my regiment in Alençon and stopped off in this misbegotten town to seek an old acquaintance and spend an evening with him. While he was seeing me back to the inn, we were set upon by a bunch of assassins, and my friend was shot and killed. Huguenot. Huguenot's cutthroat, your own night guard, who knows? Seems that everyone is mad in this town. In all events, I took to my heels for my life, made the mistake of turning into your street, from which there was no escape. I backed against your door, hoping perhaps to stay unnoticed in the shadow of the portico. To my surprise, it opened with my weight, and naturally I stepped in, only to have it closed by some mechanism beyond my comprehension. When I tried to open it, there was neither latch, nor handle, nor any means to accomplish that. And of course, that's what Jean Gavarai and Mongers were working at down there all evening. It wasn't you they expected to trap, but... Who? Who? The cause of all this. Oh, please, I, I know not your name, but... Please forgive me for what I said before. Oh, mademoiselle. The longer I spend with you, the more I could forgive you everything. Oh, don't jest with me, please. It is all my fault that you are caught as you are. Oh, what can I do? Well, let's make a start by doing what I have done and tell me the answer to all these riddles. I'm ashamed. And yet, there's so little to tell. I was left an orphan early and had been brought up in this house mainly by the sire himself. He's not married. His wife died when I was 14. I've not been very happy since. That's why three months ago, when a young captain began to stand near me every day in church, and I saw that I pleased him. Why wouldn't you go on? Oh, I'm much to blame. I was so glad that anyone should offer me love that when he pressed me a letter, I took it home and I read it with pleasure. And since that time, he's written me so many. But in the last few, asked me to leave my door open some night so he might come and, and talk with me on the stairs. How no one took him to suspect me, I don't know. Uh, there are always idiots with little to do but let their tongues wag. I suppose so. Well, tonight at Vespers, the captain handed me a desperate note that he was to be transferred. Tonight was his last night, and again he begged that I would leave the door open. And in the carriage, coming home, the sire forced the note from my hand and read it. And when we got home, he ordered me to dress as you see me. And when I would not tell him the captain's name, he must have laid the trap for him into which you fell. I don't know how to apologize or, or to ask you to forgive me. Neither is necessary. Oh, but it is. To have put you, a complete stranger, in such a degrading and embarrassing position, I'm so ashamed. Mademoiselle, you've honored me with your confidence. It only remains for me to prove myself not unworthy of the honor. I see your uncle is back in his favorite chair. What are you going to do? If you will go first and let me follow, I'll show you. Ah, are you in some haste for the ceremony? Messiah, I believe I have some say in the matter of this marriage. So let me say this at once and for all. I will be no party to forcing your niece against her inclination. Really? Had it been offered to me freely, I should have been proud to accept her hand, but it is clear that she is as good as she is beautiful. But as things stand, I have the honor, Messiah, of refusing. Why do you smile, sir? I am afraid that you do not clearly understand your options. Well, follow me to the window, please. See this rope? Weaved efficiently through the ring set in the upper masonry. Now mark my words. If you refuse to marry my niece, I shall have you hanged out of this window by sunrise. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Your family may be well enough in its way, the boy, 
But if you sprang from Charlemagne himself, I would not permit you to refuse the hand of a Malécois with impunity. Oh, what did he say, Uncle? Listen to this. This is Listen. between this young man and myself. Be quiet. The honor of my house has been compromised. I believe you to be the guilty person. At the very least, you're now in the secret. There are other ways of settling affairs among gentlemen. You wear a sword, which I hear you have used with distinction. Where am I you? Yes, Messiah. You would be dead out of hand before you reached your sword. And let us not rush anything. You have a good two hours to resolve your problem. And if you will give me your word of honor to await my return before attempting anything desperate, I shall withdraw my retainers and leave you in privacy. You have my word of honor. I declare, monsieur, the more I see of you, the better I think of you. Well, come, Chaplain, with your excess baggage for the moment. But marry you shall, for dangle from yonder ring. You shall not die. You shall marry me, after all. I've been trained for knighthood, madam. Think you for a moment I stand in fear of death? But I cannot have you slain for a mere scruple. You underrate the difficulty. What you may be too generous to refuse, I may be too proud to accept. In a moment of noble feeling for me, you forget what you may owe to another. Oh, my dear, dear. Oh, you shame me. Oh, mademoiselle, please, oh, no, please. No, in God's name, leave me alone. I can hold it back no longer. <laughs> was in an agony of embarrassment. I cannot bear to see a woman cry. And I was as helpless as a babe. I looked at Blanche and thought how much I had grown to love her. But steal her from another man who was not there to stand and fight? Monsieur Bellieu, I want to help you. For you have been so noble. Put it in my power to do something more for you but weep service can I ask of you? You have a sweet nature. And overestimate a small service. I am looking at you and seeing the noblest man I ever met. Who is to die in a mousetrap? With no more noise than my own squeaking. I will not have my champion think meanly of himself. You have no cause to hang your head, nor will I mine. Pray, do you not think me beautiful? Oh, in... indeed, mademoiselle, I do. Well, I'm glad of that. And how many men in France have been asked in marriage by a beautiful maiden with her own lips and who have refused her to her face? You are very good. But you can't make me forget I was asked in pity and not for love. Can you look in my eyes now and believe that it was for anything but love? I have loved you since the first moment you took my part against my uncle. As I have loved you. Ah. But the captain... Oh, he means nothing to me. He never did. It was just a, a contact with the outside world. Good Lord, it's sunrise. Come with me quickly to the window. There. Open the arras. The sun is shining. The world is still there. Now, what are we to say to my uncle when he returns? What you will. Blanche, you have seen whether or not I fear death. If you do care for me, don't let me lose my life in a misapprehension. But make no mistake. I love you better than life itself. I can offer you your freedom. My uncle would far rather punish or capture the real culprit. If you must escape... The captain's name is René de Parterre. I never heard the name. And if I did, it is forgotten. Well, children, have you decided? Messire de Maletroit, not by suasion or fear of death, but because I have learned to know the lady and love her. I, Dennis, 
Demoiselle de Beaulieu request the honor of your niece's hand in holy matrimony. Tell me, I had a feeling for you the first moment I set eyes on you. Welcome to the Maletroit family, nephew. <laughs> Once again, and this time for the last time, we close the Sire de Malatois' door on a happy ending. I'll be back shortly. A few good men. That's what the Marines are looking for. A few good college men who want to lead. Men who have enough on the ball to be eligible for PLC. Platoon leaders class. Not everyone can make it. It takes brains. It takes muscle. And summer training is no picnic. It takes men who want a real challenge. The challenge of leading Marine ground troops. Flying sophisticated Marine aircraft. Or serving as Marine lawyers. If you're one of the few who can make it, there's financial assistance available during school. Up to $2,700 over three years. There's even free civilian flying lessons for qualified men. PLC ground. PLC air. PLC law. For a few good men. sentimentalists among the listeners, Captain Parterre had no serious intentions. He was indeed trifling with Blanche's innocent affections. Little did he know, nor would he have cared, that he brought two young people to a happy and enduring marriage. The captain died shortly thereafter in a brawl over a gaming debt, which is neither here nor there in our story, except that it's nice to know that every so often... Virtue does triumph. Our cast included Michael Wager, William Redfield, Marion Seldes, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Marvelous how you can get around when you've got no body, isn't it? See you? Little white dog, curly tail. Oh, silly little thing. And see that big blue station wagon? It's going to hit him. No! I have got him. Got him, Cynthia. I've saved him. You'll probably get run over anyhow one of these days. No, he won't. No, he won't. I'm going to keep my eye on him. What about all the others? Them too. And cats and people and everybody. Oh, Cynthia, why did it take me so long to find out what I was born to do? I could have spent my whole life doing this. Cynthia, my afterlife is going to be a hundred times more exciting than my life ever was. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams.
sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. the new series of radio programs, The Clock. Got a little time to spare? Thirty minutes, maybe, by the clock? But first, perhaps I'd better introduce myself. Of course, I have so many names, at times it becomes rather confusing. In England, for instance, they call me Ben, and I have a large and extremely showy flat in Westminster Tower. It's uh, distinguished, to put it mildly. But <laughs> just between the two of us, I feel more comfortable at the end of a the chain. Then again, you can find me on your wrist, ticking away on a minor key. Of course, there's the quiet old lady who keeps a favorite place for me in the corner of her room. To her, I'm known as Grandfather. Yes, I'm known by many names to a multitude of people, and I know a multitude of people by their names. People whose lives have so much to do with the clock. But here I am, the only one who can really sell time. So here are 30 minutes on the counter for whoever wants to buy. 30 genuine 14 karat solid gold platinum lined minutes, carefully tested. And here's a gentleman who thinks he can afford them. Well, fine. Wrap them up for Wilbur Cook. I've made a sale. But remember, Wilbur, no refunds, no exchanges. Well, the clock in our office is a, a time clock, and it's got a handle on it. And I have pushed that handle for 13 years, twice a day. At nine, when I come in, and when I go out at... Uh... Five o'clock on the dot. Leave it to Wilbur, most dependable guy in the firm. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm in a hurry to get home, Charlie. So if you're... I'm going your way. Come on. Well, uh... How's it hitting you, Wilbur? How's the score? I'm not complaining. Say, how long have you been working for this company? Thirteen years. You ever been late to work? Well, not that I remember. And I've never been absent either. Never been late, never been absent. <laughs> oh, Wilbur, you're terrific. Yes, sir. I wish you wouldn't make fun of me, Charlie. Make fun of you? Me? I know what the rest of the men in the office think. They, they laugh at me. Now, Wilbur. But I don't care. I haven't got time to waste my money on silly things. I've got a wife at home who looks after me and loves me. And as far as I'm concerned, that's all that counts. Now, listen, Wilbur, you got me wrong. I'm all for that. I appreciate the important things in life. You don't mind working hard anymore day after day, year after year. You don't mind that at all, Charlie, as long as you've got someone to work for. Someone you can, you can always count on. You said it, if you're lucky. Lucky? Well, what's luck got to do with a, with a wonderful wife? Well, because all women aren't built that way. Why, just last night I was reading in the papers how a guy's wife ran away with the neighborhood butcher. You know, even with the price of meat, it ain't a good excuse. What happened? Did he, he find them? Oh, yeah, he caught up with them. He put two slugs in the butcher's skull and then pushed his wife out of an eight-story window. Oh, that's horrible. Ah, she deserved what she got. Well, she even tried to poison him before she ran away. Stuck some stuff in his food. How'd you like that? Well, it's hard to believe it. How things can happen? Of course, the guy was a dope. He should have hired somebody else to bump him off. You mean the of people who kill for money? Well, Al McHugh once told me he knew a joint on 8th and 5, a pool room, where you could hire a trigger man for a hundred bucks 
He just asked for a guy named Arch. Oh, I wouldn't pay any attention to him, Charlie, if I were you. Oh, it's no skin off my teeth. <laughs> I don't see myself slapping a hundred bucks on the line for any dame. <laughs> hey, I think I'll take a bus. You coming over? I know. I I'll walk. Well, don't walk too slow. What do you mean? <laughs> From what they told me, Wilbur, <laughs> there's a butcher on every block. <laughs> Charlie didn't worry me at all with all his stupid jokes. A thing like that can never happen to me and Millie, not in a million years. But then, you know, I started to think of something that happened a few days before. It had me puzzled at the time. It uh, was a letter from Millie with no return address. The postmark said Chicago, and I'd left it on the kitchen table before I went to work. Well, at night, I asked the kind of automatically who it was from. And she told me it was just an advertisement. An advertisement from Chicago. And the address on the envelope wasn't pink. I looked at Millie for a minute. But she turned the other way. She seemed nervous, scared. I asked to see the letter and I saw her face turn pale. Then she said she'd thrown it away an hour before. And as I was thinking about the letter, suddenly I realized I was running on the street. And I felt silly. I, I mean, what was I in such a hurry about? get home and she'd be standing there looking at me with that, that funny smile or <laughs> what was it a worry about it was Millie then I reached the corner and I saw him it was too dark to recognize his face and he was walking the other way but he'd just come out of my house a man in my house but I was getting too excited I, I wasn't being sensible why couldn't there be a man in my house sure why not to live in the laundry maybe or, or fixing the stove Oh, Millie would explain it. I was letting my imagination play tricks with me. Millie would explain it as soon as I got home. Wilbur, is that you? Yes, Millie. Hungry? Not very. What's the matter, Wilbur? Don't you feel well? No, I, I'm fine. I just feel tired of you. Oh, sit down and read your paper. I'll have dinner ready. Uh, and Millie. Yes? Yeah. How was everything today? Everything? Why, well, same as usual. My shirt's come back? Your shirt? Oh, the laundry isn't due till Monday. You know that. The handyman been up here? What for? Uh, that broken coil on the kitchen range. He fixed that yesterday. Don't you remember? Oh, yes. Wilbur, what's the matter with you? Well, I, I guess I missed you today more than usual, that's all. No, I miss you too, it's... Get gloom from being home from nine to five. Alone? I guess it does, Millie. Now, I've got to finish getting dinner ready. You stay here until I call you, dear. Well, I opened up my paper, but I didn't say the words. Alone. She said she was alone. Yet that man. I saw him. I leaned back in my easy chair, weak and tired. My face was wet and my shirt was sticking to my back. I reached for a handkerchief behind me in my pocket, and my hand touched something. I, I dug down under a cushion. I put out a pair of gloves. Main gloves. But they weren't mine. At night I didn't sleep. I stayed awake and I wondered how, how a thing like that could be. What had I done? Hadn't I been faithful and kind and hard working? Hadn't I skimped and I, I stayed for 13 years at a job I couldn't stand? Why was she doing this and why? The night was endless. Next morning I started out for work as if nothing had happened. But I didn't go to the office. Instead, I waited across the street from my house in a door, out of sight. I was a spy, spying on my own wife. Why, Wilbur Cook! Oh, uh, good morning, uh... Lauren, Lauren Fields. Goodness, I haven't seen you in ages. Oh, you know, I think it's terrible that neighbors like you and Millie and me don't get to see each other more often. Oh, well, we've been so busy. Oh, now, don't give me that, Wilbur. You folks are regular gadabouts. Did you have a good time the other night? The other night? Oh, at the Stewart Hotel. I was going to say hello when I saw Millie going in, but she went by so fast. You saw Millie going to the Stewart Hotel? Sure. She was meeting you there, wasn't she? Oh, oh yeah. I remember now that the other night I was working overtime in the office and I met Millie Lane. How was the dance band? Any good? Oh, it couldn't be better. Gee, I haven't been to a dance in months. Well, nine o'clock, I'd better get going. Remember me to Millie. Do you tell? 
She saw my wife going to Stewart Hotel. She took a place with a cheap reputation. And I'm almost sure they don't even have a band. Well, I don't know how long I waited. It might have been an hour. Finally, my wife came out of the house. She walked up to the corner without looking around, and I followed her. On the corner, she caught a bus, the number four. I took a cab, and I trailed behind. At 20th and Grand, I saw her leave. I got out of the cab, half a block away, and I watched her turn into a doorway underneath a dirty marquee. I looked up at the sign. It said, Stuart Hotel. For the rest of the day, I just wandered around. I didn't go to work. I felt sick to my stomach, my legs were weak. I kept saying to myself over and over again, my wife, my own wife had seen another man. It was impossible, but it was true. Oh, around six, I found myself in front of my house. I, I tried to act naturally as I closed the door. Wilbur? Yes? Oh, just a minute, I'll be right in. Oh, Millie's handbag was on the sofa and the catch had opened. Something was sticking out. It was the bank book we used for our joint account. Our savings account. I picked up the book and I opened it. Balance was six hundred dollars. Should have been nine. I examined the withdrawal column. There were three. They amounted to a hundred dollars a piece that all been made the week before. On top of everything, she was even giving him our money. Come on, Wilbur. Soup's on. Oh, Millie. Yes. I. Uh... What's the matter, Wilbur? Oh, nothing. I want to ask. What is it? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Let's eat milk. All right, then, dear. Come on. Don't let the soup get cold. I took a spoonful of soup and it tasted sour. I could hardly swallow it. I wasn't hungry, but I had to make a show. Well, I tried again. And it tasted even worse than before. And then I realized that she was trying to poison me. Oh, what is it? I need some air. Wilbur! I need some air, I tell you. Wilbur, come back here! I walked like a man who was doped. She wanted to kill me. She wanted to kill me. But I had to beat her to it, and I had to do it fast. All my life had been kicked around. I'd never hit back. But too much, even for me. I'd get her first, and then I'd get the man. But first, I'd get her. finger writes, and having read moves on. Nor all your piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all your tears wash out a word of it. Time is measured by the stars, and some say our lives are also measured by the stars. I wonder what they hold now. But will they cook? What did Charlie tell me? The pool will make them vine. We could have had a trigger man for a hundred bucks. Just ask our man named Arch. I can find a pool. Hey, that's it. Right in your corner pocket. Looking for someone, Jim? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Who? Oh. Arch. Arch? I, uh, I, I, I have a, a job for Arch. Follow me. Yeah, in there. He's, uh, inside that room? That's right. Thank you. Wait just a minute. Uh, what are you doing? Don't look like the gun toting type, but Arch likes to be careful. Okay, mister, you can go in. <clears throat> the room was small and dark, and there was a table and a chair and a, and a spittoon. A man was at the table playing solitaire. He uh, wasn't a big man, and he was thin, and he didn't look up as I entered. He just motioned to, to touch here. Sit down. Thank you. Oh, what a silver. Uh, yes. What for? Uh, business. What kind of business? Well, there's, 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 there's someone I, I don't like. Uh-huh. I, uh, I understand I, I may be able to do something about it. Who sent you here? I know one. How did you know where to come? I, I, I just heard. Uh, how much you want to pay? How much is it? Order that. I, I, I know what? How tough a job it is. Well, it, it won't be hard. Who is it? My wife. What's the matter? She find another guy? How much? hundred bucks. All right. In advance. All right, I've got it right here. 
Okay. Thanks. Uh, and I, she'll leave the house at noon tomorrow. I, I'll see that she does. It's a poor family house with red brick, and the address is 827 Allen Avenue. I, I'll print it on this card, and the name is Cook. Tomorrow, 12 sharp, okay. It's, it's got to be done away from the house. Okay, okay. What does she look like? Oh, she's pretty. What else? Uh, about five foot four. Got a picture. Uh, a picture? You want it, baby? Oh, yes, yes, I have. Now, uh, this was taken two years ago. Uh-huh. Uh, is, is that all? That's all. Can can I go now? Sure, sure. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll be seeing you. You ain't gonna be seeing nobody. But everything will be taken care of. When I left the place, I got that feeling again. Like I was gonna be sick. I hardly knew where I was walking. And I found myself in a bar across the street. It was the first time I'd taken a drink in my life. I had another, and another, and four more. I poured it down in my throat like water. It burned my throat, and... And I left the bar, and I... I started home. It was almost midnight, and I thought she'd be asleep. But when I opened the door, I saw the light was on in the bedroom. Walter? Yes, it's me. Where have you been? Out. It's almost midnight. What of it? Wilbur, I want to talk to you. I'm too tired to talk. There's, there's something you've got to know. I know too much already. You found the bank book, didn't you? And you probably found the gloves. Steve told me he left them here. Steve? I had to give him money, Wilbur. And I couldn't tell you. He made me promise I wouldn't tell. Oh, don't blame him. He's been living in Chicago for the past three years, and he's been gambling again. He welched on my death, and he was afraid for his life. He, he wanted to hide so they wouldn't find him. He made me swear I wouldn't tell you, Wilbur. He made me swear. Huh? I know I had no right to give him that money, not after you worked so hard for it, Wilbur, but maybe that's why I kept my promise to Steve. I was afraid you'd be mad. I couldn't help it, Wilbur, honest. He is my brother. Really? Oh, brother. Crazy brother. And all along, I, I thought it was another man. Millie, I've got to stop him. Well, where are you him. going? Brother! I still got time. I still got time. Taxi, where's the taxi? Taxi! I can buy him. Hurry, please. I've got to stop him. I've got to. I'm trying to get over, please. I can't tell the police I made a bargain to kill my wife and now I've changed my mind. But all he wanted was the money. I'll just tell him to keep the money and forget the whole thing. Oh, I must have been crazy. I must have been out of my mind that I'm all right now. She loves me. She's never stopped. Oh, Millie. Millie, can you ever forgive me? Wait here, driver. No. No, it can't be. can be. Hey, hey, you looking for something, mister? This, this poor woman. It isn't it open? Can't you read that sign up there? Closed. Until further notice. Closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you better go home. It's, uh, it's getting late. Yeah, it's getting late. Too late. Millie was sleeping when I got back home. I, I lay down on the couch with my clothes on. And I tried to think. Millie found me there the next morning when she got up. Wilbur. Good morning, Millie. Oh, Wilbur, I'm so glad you're back. I thought... I... Oh, Wilbur, you're ill. I'm sorry I ran out like that last night. I... Millie, who are going now? Why, just to the kitchen, dear, to make some coffee. Oh, Millie, don't leave me. Stay with me here all day, please. Of course I will, dearest. If you're sick, what else would I do? I'm very sick. But you mustn't leave me for a minute. Maybe I'd better call a doctor. Oh, no, no, don't do that. I'll, I'll be all right on a few hours. Just sit here with me, Millie. Don't go away. Oh, poor Wilbur. And it's all my fault. No, no, Millie, don't say that. You... Millie! 
Oh, well, there. Don't answer it, Millie, for heaven's sake. Don't answer it. But why not? Oh, keep away from that door. But why? I'll be right back. Millie! It's only the grocery boy. Oh, thank you, Danny. <sighs> Wilbur, what's wrong? I told you I was sorry. I, I thought you'd understand. What can I oh, do? It's not you, Millie. I. My nerves, they. They ain't so good. I. I. I guess I just need a rest. Well, but you can go on this way. You look so ill. I'll bet you didn't sleep a wink last night. Well, I wasn't tired. You've got to get some rest, darling. I'll make you comfortable inside. No, no, no. I'll stay here on the couch and you sit down next to me, Molly. Oh, my darling. Just stay right here where I can... where I can, can watch you. All right, dear. Up to 9.30, and I could hear the ticking from the couch. Every second, every minute was bringing us closer to the time. And I didn't have a plan. I had to have a plan. I had to think of one. But when you haven't slept for 30 hours, it's hard to keep your eyes open and stay awake. I, I didn't know I... Before you sleep, I didn't know She wrote, be back in half an hour. Half an hour, and the clock was trying to know it. Oh, Millie, Millie, thank heaven. Your name, Cook? Wilbur Cook? And I knew. It was too late. Said that Millie was a policeman outside my door. He'd come to tell me that she'd just been killed. I said, is your name Cook? Yes, officer, I'm Wilbur Cook. You're lucky, mister. Lucky you're still alive. We found this card with your address on it, and we picked up Arch Marone. Arch Marone? This guy makes a speciality of killing for hire. You might have been next on his list. Know anything about it? I... I don't. Ever been to a pool room on 8th and Vine? Yes, I, I... I've been there. Bookie hangout. We raided it last night. Closed it up for keeps. Say, you don't look like the type who would hang out in a joint like that. You play the horse? No, 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 I've never had. It's like a game of billiards, huh? Well, you watch your step from now on. This punk might have gotten your address either to rob you or to rub you out. You stay home with a little woman, Wilbur. It's safer. Wilbur! Oh, oh. is this her, Wilbur? Yes. Well, ma'am, you want to take good care of your husband, you know. He's not looking too good. Oh, I will, officer. I will. That's the third man. Well, goodbye for now. Uh, goodbye, officer. Goodbye. Millie. What did the policeman want? He made a mistake, and so did I. Oh, oh Wilbur, you look a little better than you did before, dear. <laughs> Were you right when you woke up and found me gone? Uh, you'll never know how much. Oh, Wilbur. <laughs> oh, Millie. I'm a fool. No, you're not. Now, come inside and I'll fix you up some lunch. Oh, but I'm a lucky fool and I am a happy one right now. And that's the story of Wilbur Cook as recorded by the clock. I rather like a happy ending, don't you? I like to feel that life is really worth living in in spite of all the shortcomings and mistakes. <laughs> uh, but then I've always been known to be a very optimistic fellow. Oh, yes, and I'll prove it to you the next time you're late to make that train. You'll look at me and you see your time is short, but there'll be something about my face that'll make you think the minutes will stretch. And I'll do my best to stretch them, just for you. But I see my time is running short and I think I'll have to leave. I'd like to thank you for your hospitality and patience. You've all been excellent hosts. This program was written by Lawrence Klee, and you heard Hart McGuire as the clock, 
and as Wilbur, Ozzy Wenburn, as Millie, Lynn Murphy. Others were Lloyd Burrell, Madge Ryan, Richard Meekle, Alan Trevor, Owen Ainley, Albert Garcia. The Clock is a Grace Gibson Radio production directed by John Saul. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. The manufacturers of State Express 3.5 Filter King Cigarettes Take pleasure in presenting the creaking door. Good evening, friends of the creaking door. The creaking door is open. So do come in. No, no, no. Not that way. Follow me into the dark tunnel. Be careful. It's very dark. You must be very careful that you don't tread on any corpse. It might be yours. <laughs> Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3-5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3-5s today. Sandy shoreline, police patrol cars move slowly through the thick mist in their search for an unknown killer, a mysterious man wearing a white scarf who has already strangled three women.
Come down here to the beach on nights like this. Wallace, couldn't we turn back? Oh, but it's such a wonderful thing. If you don't mind, I'd rather go home. Hi, Jen Stark. You're actually afraid. No. No, why should I be afraid, Wallace? You're with me. Of course, my dear. I'm with you. But those stories about those poor women who were murdered on the beach. So that's what's bothering you. It's only natural, isn't it? How do we know who may be near us in this fog? How do we know what may lie ahead? <laughs> my Janice, my darling, that's what makes life interesting. Not knowing what lies ahead. The next step, the next minute. Wallace. Please, I'm getting chilly. Well, why didn't you say so, darling? Here, I'll wrap my scarf around you. I'd rather go back to the house. Oh, really, Janice, you're acting like a stupid child. Now, come on. Let me put this around your neck. All oh, right. There. Now, I'll wrap it good and tight so, so you'll be warm. Janice, please. What's wrong, Janice? Did you think I was going to hurt you? No, no. Well? I just noticed my bag. Your bag? What about it? It's gone. Are you sure you had it with you, my darling? Yes, positive. I must have dropped it somewhere along the beach. Well, we'll look for it in the morning. It may be gone by then. I had a pin in it, the diamond pin my mother left me. Why do you lie to me, Janice? Lie? I didn't lie. That pin you're talking about... There on your dress now. Oh, don't you? I'd forgotten. I don't know what's wrong with me tonight. It's my nerves. Well, perhaps we should look for your bag after all. If, if you don't mind, Wallace, I'll wait here till you come back. But I wouldn't want to leave you alone, my dear. Here in the dark and the fog. Your needs, my dear. Oh, I, I feel much easier now. I'm not afraid. Very well. Now be sure to say like that. All right, Wallace. Wallace? Is that you? I thought you went the other way. What? Why didn't you answer me? Please. Please, Wallace. Hello, editorial. Miss Winston? Yes. You're the one who wrote those articles about the strangler. Yes, that's me. Well, if you want some more information for your stories, drive out to Ronson Point immediately. Who's speaking? The man in the white scarf has just claimed his fourth victim. What? What did you say? Alec, get on the other phone quickly. Uh, all right. Call the police. Ask them to trace the call. All right. Now, would you please tell me again what it was you said? Are you saying that another murder has taken place? Hello? Hello? Oh, don't bother about the call, Alec. He hung up. What's it all about, Dottie? The strangler in the white scarf. What? The man on the phone gave me a tip on the fourth victim. It may be a crank, but I'm going to make sure. Ransom Point, he said. Dottie, you can't go out there, but don't you realize that it might have been the strag himself who telephoned you? I wanted to get even with you for the stories you wrote. Yes, Alec. It has occurred to me. And that's the reason we're going out to Ronson Point right away. It wasn't a hoax after all. It must have been the strangler. Look, Dottie, a white scarf tied around her neck. Strangled the same way as the others. 
I'm very cold, please. Perhaps Dr. Hirschman was right after all. Who's Dr. Hirschman? A psychiatrist. He has a theory that the stranger either visited or read a, a great deal about Melbourne, India. India? Well, what's that got to do with murders? Three years ago, there, there was a cast who killed their enemies by strangling them with strips of white cloth. The cloth was knotted and pulled in the same manner as that white scarf around the woman's throat. Just a moment. Over there. Where? Behind that row of trees. I, I thought I saw something move. Something white. Oh, Alec. I'm not sure, but we're not taking any chances. Come on. Alex, this isn't the way to the car. I know. So where are you taking it? That light over there through the bushes. Into the house? Yes, perhaps. Let's run for it. That strange sound. I wonder what it is. I don't know. It seems to be an animal of some kind. Never heard anything like it before. That's my pet tiger. <laughs> you, you live here? Yes, with my brother. We're, we're looking for a telephone now. I'm Dorothy Winston, a, a reporter from the Tribune. I don't care where you're from. You're trespassing on private grounds. You'll please leave immediately. But someone's been murdered. She found her body on the beach. You will do as I told you. Get off these grounds. My brother is ill. Much too ill to be. Wallace? Wallace! Go back to the house, Ralph. Oh, Wallace. I've been looking for you. Where have you been? You know very well I've been out here feeding the tiger. I thought perhaps you went back to the place Ralph, where the... You shouldn't be out here. You know what the doctor said about the night here. Now go back to the house. But who are these people, Wallace? The young lady is a reporter, Ralph. A reporter from the Tribune. I'd like to use your phone, but your father won't let me. I didn't want to disturb you, Ralph. I won't be disturbed. Then I suppose it's all right to make the call now, Mr... Grimsdale. Oh, very well. We'll take you to it. Come along. If you're a reporter, I suppose you want to phone your paper about... <laughs> Wallace! My arm, you're back to me. Forgive me, Ralph, I, if I held you too tightly. You know how unsteady you've been lately. I, I didn't want you to fall. You squeezed my arm because you didn't want me to talk. Now, really, Ralph, you have these people believing I'm some sort of monster. You're free to say anything you please. You know that. Say anything you wish. I... I... You see... You've nothing to say. Oh, Wallace. Please forgive me. I'm just upset because you left me alone so much tonight. But I haven't left you alone, Ralph. I don't know why you say such things. I've been in the house with you all evening. Don't you remember? Oh, oh, yes. Now I remember. You've been with me all evening in the house. All right, Ralph. I think you're strong enough now to take uh, these people to the phone. I'm going to go outside a while and finish feeding my pet. Yes, Wallace. This way, please. You go with this gentleman, Alec. Uh, but Dotty. He's Alec. Telephone for me. All right, but hurry. <laughs> what do you find to be so amusing, Mr. Grimsdale? I find the obvious very amusing, Miss Winston. You stayed behind to watch me. Isn't that correct? Yes, in a way. Don't you think you're acting a bit rash? Perhaps, but... But that pet tiger of yours out there fascinates me. Oh? It's quite a rare species of tiger, isn't it? I didn't realize you're an expert. I have reason to know about that particular breed of tiger. Reason? You have been to India, haven't you? No. You're lying. I'd be a bit more careful of what I said if I were you, Miss Winston. You're not fooling me, Mr. Grimsdale, with that alibi of yours. Now, look here. You were on the beach earlier this evening. Ridiculous. You changed your seat. You have changed it because the other one had a piece torn out of it. I found that piece on the beach. Next to that woman's body. Now you are lying. Am I? 
For your information, Mr. Groomsdale, I have that torn piece right here in my hand. Uh, give it to me. Oh, uh, 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 my throat. Open your hand. Oh, don't open it. Oh, wait. Uh, all right, uh, I'll open it. <sighs> I knew you were lying. There is nothing in your hand. Of course not. But I found out what I wanted to know. No? What are you talking about? The way you knotted my scarf, Mr. Greensdale, and the way you tightened it around my throat. That's all I wanted to know. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. Boyfriend weren't really clever, were they? As they say in the classics, a torn suit on the beach is worth two in a tiger's cage. But let us proceed with our tale. What are you doing here? Looking for you. I suppose it's your turn to keep tabs on me now, is it? Dottie told me you tried to choke her with the scarf. Why did you run away? You knew I called the police and run away. <laughs> really? Here you're talking nonsense. I have nothing to fear from the police. Where do you think you're going? I'm going back to the house to tell them the news. What news are you talking about, Grimsdale? The fact that you and Miss Winston are outrageous liars. What? I looked all along this section of the beach. I found no trace of a woman's body. You're just saying that. It's a trick you're trying to pull. The body's over there by those rocks and you know it. Lying, am I? Then go and see for yourself. I will. Believe me, Lancey. You're just wasting your time. It's gone. What did you do with the body, Grimsdale? What? But where did he go to? Where did he go? Oh, well, Miss Winston, how nice of you to visit me here in my prison cell. You seem very much at ease, Mr. Grimsdale, for a man who had so little time to live. Oh, I don't know, Miss Winston. I have an idea I'll live longer than you will. Don't you think it's a little late for you to threaten me? Miss Winston, you're meddling in something that shouldn't concern you. Alec Lancey was my fiancé. You'd do better to let the police capture his murderer. They already have. They won't keep me here another 24 hours. And when I'm free, Miss Winston... Oh, you couldn't frighten me. Janice Craig's body was found this morning in a clump of bushes. Very interesting. Still out, Miss you can go now. But, but you can't let this man go. Now, look, miss. I've got my instructions. This way, Grimsdale. Uh, just a moment. Oh, you uh, have something else to say, Miss Winston? I haven't given up, Mr. Grimsdale. I'll prove that you murdered Alec and the others. If it's the last thing I ever do. I see. Oh, well, Miss Winston, who knows? It might very well be the last thing. You will ever do. Hmm. 
Miss Winston, thank heaven you're here. I was afraid you wouldn't come. You said it was a matter of life and death. Oh, it is, believe me. My brother Wallace lied to the police, and he made me lie for him, too. What do you mean? He told you and the police he was in the house with me all evening, but he wasn't. I was the one who telephoned you that night. I thought it was your voice, but I wasn't sure. Go on. Wallace was out with Janice that night. I saw them walk toward the beach. Why did you call me instead of the police? I was afraid to call the police. Afraid of what Wallace might do to me. He, he, he'd kill me if he thought I was talking to you like this. But I just had to tell someone. I just had to. Did your brother tell you why he wanted you to lie for him? Yes. But I didn't believe him. What reason did he give you? He said he had nothing to do with Janice's murder. But there was no way of proving his innocence. He was afraid he would be found guilty if I didn't do as he told me. <laughs> Tell me, Ralph. Your brother's been to India, hasn't he? Why do you ask me that? Please answer my question. Yes. We lived in the Punjab for five years. I thought so. When we saw the tiger in that cage, I... What's the matter? The tiger. He didn't run. The cage is empty. Your brother must have taken it away. Yes, Miss Winston. I did. Oh, Morris. I took it away because, unfortunately, it's dead. It was shot. Oh, oh Wallace, uh, I... What do you say, Sir Ralph? I, I didn't say anything. Not anything. Go into the house immediately. Now, wait a minute. Are you meddling again, Miss Winston? I'm going to protect the Crown's key witness in the case against you, Mr. Grimsdale. So, Ralph... You told her. Yes, yes, I told her. I told her everything. I don't care what you do to me. I don't care because I... Stop that. Stop that. It's terrible. Stop that. Stop that. You won't throw giving orders to anyone, Mr. Goldberg. Put that gun away, you fool. Don't you dare move. I promise if you do, I'll fire. Ralph, hurry. Call the police. I'll keep him here until the police arrive. Ralph, don't do it. Call the police, I say. He'll kill you too if you don't. Yes. Yes, he will. I call him right away. Ralph. Ralph, come back. He'll be back, Mr. Grimsdale. Wait, the key. You're making a mistake. There's no mistake about you now. Not after what your brother told me. For all you know, I may just have been trying to protect Ralph. It's obvious how strange he is. It's too late to blame it on him. But I'm innocent. And I can prove it if you'd only give me half a chance. Like the chance he gave my Annie? I wasn't anywhere near Lansing when he was killed. I ran away and left him alone on the beach. And I suppose the same thing happened with Janice Craig. I was in love with Janice. I was going to marry her. Ralph was always afraid that he'd be left alone. Oh, you can't make me believe that, Mr. Greenstein. Just give me some kind of a chance, Miss Winston. Before it's too late for both of us. I had me Janice with Janice at night. But I didn't do it. I couldn't have done it. What do you mean, you couldn't have? I'll show you why, if you go with me to the place to have it. Do you think I'm that foolish? I know, Miss Winston. You want to find your fiancé's murderer. But you'll never find the killer if they could have to me. Please. Please. Give me a chance to prove to you who the real killer is. Before it's too late. All right, Mr. Grimsdale. I'll give you just this one chance. Janice and I were standing just about here on the beach. Go on. Janice was frightened. She had the reason. Please. He says you'd give me a chance to explain. I think it is. But remember, our fire was done on the slightest provocation. Janice had just made mention of the mysterious strangler. She felt a sudden chill. So I placed my scarf over her shoulders. A white scarf? Yes, I've always had a preference for white scarves. Like the one you're wearing now? Huh? Uh, I didn't realize I put it on this evening. Perhaps, Mr. Grimsdale, you do many things you don't realize. You think I'm insane? You don't have much time left, Mr. Grimsdale. Go on with your explanation. But as I said, I took off my scarf and placed it over... Janice's shoulders like this. No, you don't. But Miss Winston... Get your hands away from me. But I... Put that scarf back, baby. 
Very well. But I only wanted to show you what happened. I knew it would be something like this, Mr. Greenfield. I knew you wanted to get me down here on the beach so you could kill me like you did the other five. No, no, Miss Winston, that isn't the reason. Out of those five people, Janice was the only one I knew. I couldn't possibly have a motive for killing the others. They were total strangers to me. Psychopathic murderers very often kill without motive. Yes, I know. That's why I wanted to tell you about Ralph. A person like him might kill only for the thrill it gives him. Do you have anything more to tell Yes, me? just one more thing. Janice told me that she'd lost her bag. I started back along the beach to look for it. Yes? It was difficult finding anything because of the fog. I went about a hundred yards. Yes? And I gave up the search. I returned here and found Janice strangled to death with my scarf. I returned to the house immediately because I knew I'd be blamed for the... Wait! What is it? Over there, beside the rock. It looks like a woman's handbag. Come on. Give me the bag. It's Janice's missing bag. You'd better pick it up, Miss Winston. No, no. You pick it up. You still don't believe me. Pick it up, I said. All right. I will. I don't know why you don't trust me now. You have the gun and nothing could... <laughs> I knew you could resist another victim, Miss Winston. I knew. That's where you're wrong, Mr. Greenfield. Entirely wrong. There are other ways of committing murder. I just wanted to feel the scarf tighten around your neck just for a moment. Get up. And I knew it was you. I just had to prove it. How did you know? That night I ran from the beach. I saw a woman at the edge of the woods. A woman wearing a white scarf like you're wearing now, Miss Winston. I followed you back to town to your office. That's where the police were wrong. They were looking for a man, and all the time it was a woman. But they'll never know. After I kill you with a gun with which I killed the tiger, it'll be all over. There'll be no more strangling. No, Miss Winston. You couldn't stop killing any more than you can stop breathing. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'll tell the police you tried to murder me like you did the others, and I had to shoot you in self-defense. After the gunshot, it'll all be over. Finished. <laughs> I had to wait, Wallace, until you'd moved out of the line of fire. Oh, oh she's dead. Yes, well, just as she said. After the gunshot, it will be all over. Completely finished. Let's go back to the house. <laughs> the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. Strange creatures, gruesome murders, oozing organisms, unfathomable abductions, enigmatic expeditions, an age-old malevolence, and much more. Author J.C. Moore delivers a collection of dark horror tales that are both chilling and poignant. Dark Intrigues Book 1 is filled with horror fiction for fans of short story anthologies, horror collections, ghost fiction, suspense, Possession, and more. Dark Intrigues Book 1 by J.C. Moore, available on Kindle or as an audiobook narrated by Darren Marlar. Find Dark Intrigues Book 1 on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks.
Am I glad to see you? Well, Jim Howard, welcome to Ca- uh, Cape Howell. You're just the medicine the doctor ordered. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the doctor. How are you, Bill? Never better. Say, am I glad to shake hands with you again? You're the same old Jim. Five years haven't changed you a single bit. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I can't say the same thing about you. You look tired, almost sick. I say you aren't ill, are you? Ill? Oh, no. No, I've just been working hard. Not much sleep lately. Come on, I- I've got a wagon waiting right over here. Wagon? Sure, nothing fancy about us. We'll take the wagon to the boat landing, and then we'll row over to my island. Uh, it, uh, say, now, wait a minute, Bill. Are you trying to rib me? What, what do you mean, your island? Oh, didn't I tell you? I, I haven't lived in Cape Howell for three years. I, well, I, I find it more pleasant and comfortable out on the island. But what island? Folks around here have another name for it. But don't mind them if you hear it. I call it a chape. Hmm. Uh, uh, say that again, Bill. A chape. Uh, well, what's that, Scandinavian or Esperanto? The French. Come on. Here's the wagon over here. Young John's waiting on the boat landing. Oh, I say, how is young John? Jim, I... I don't know. I'm, I'm worried about him. He's having trouble with his studies. Doesn't seem to like books and hates company. Well, I, I'd say he's more lonesome than anything else. It's more than lonesomeness, Bill. Ever since Bill Jr. died, he, he hasn't been the same. Angela and I were sorry to hear about Bill Jr. It's pretty sudden, wasn't it? Yes, pretty sudden. That's the way it is in this country, though. So much fever, so few conveniences. Oh, by the way, you say Angela and the child will be along in a few days? Oh, yes, you got my wire? Got it yesterday. I didn't know your sister lived at Lowston. Oh, yes, she has for years. Angela wants to visit about a week, and then she'll come on down here to Cape Howe by steamer. Oh, incidentally, old man, do you think this country's all right for the baby? Had her shots, has she? Oh, yes. Yes, I did everything you suggested in your letter. You know, that letter you wrote almost scared Angela out of coming. (laughs) She said if it's that dangerous here, she doesn't think we should risk the child's life by bringing her here. Well, there's no danger at all if the child's been inoculated against the three diseases I mentioned. Oh, I took care of that all right. You're sure there's no other danger? I've taken care of any other danger there might be. Hmm? What do you mean? Just that... There's nothing in the world for you or Angela to worry about. Please believe me, Jim. All right, old man, all right. Huh. Angela and I are on the first vacation we've had since we've been married. And believe you me, we're here to make the best of it. <laughs> Good, that's fine. Come on, the, the wagon's waiting, see? Right over there. Fine country, eh, what, Jim? Oh, marvelous. We've enjoyed the whole trip so far. Didn't even get seasick on the way across. Not even the baby. And she only a year old. And say, I'm anxious to see that girl. How come you named her Sandra? Oh, that's one of Angela's favorite names. Pretty name, I like it. Mm. Oh, this is the blamedest means of transportation oh. I've ever had to endure. I thought you would at least have your own limousine. No, Jim. I haven't been doing so well lately. I hope you'll be able to put up with what I have to offer you on the island. Rough and rugged, is it? Quite. I built the cabin myself. It's not much, but it's comfortable. Oh, by the way, did you bring the books I wrote you about? Books? Oh, yes, they're in the trunk. Good. I must say, that's the strangest collection of books I've ever heard of. What kind of experimenting are you doing on that island anyway? It's pretty serious, Jim, I assure you. Well, it must be. I read your books on the way across. You you did? Yes, indeed. Dr. Helgen Woodward's book on lycanthropy and Henry Joseph McClure's pamphlet on the disease Lumpus vulgaris and Guy Ender's story, Werewolf of Paris, and two other books on werewolves. 
can't for the life of me imagine, Andrews, what you want with books like that out here in this wilderness. All right, Jim, here we are. Oh, John, here's Jim Howard. You remember Mr. Howard, don't you, Johnny? Well, sure he does. How are you, John, old boy? All right. Glad to see you, sir. Say, where was that old smile I used to see? Here, let me shake your hand. No, sir. I don't want to shake hands. Oh, come on now. We're old friends, aren't we? No, Mr. Howard. Oh, I say. Now. Jim, just a minute. Let go, Mr. Howard. There. Jim. Oh, there now. Shake just like old friends. Let go. Let go my hands. Let go. Jim. Please. I say. The boy's handbill. Come on, Jim. Into the boat with you. Come along, Johnny. Johnny, get into the boat, son. Yes, sir. Come along, Jim. All right, I'm... I'm shoving off. All right, Johnny. You want to take the oars for the exercise, or you want me to row? Well, son? I told him not to shake my hand. I told him, didn't I? Johnny. Can I help it? Is it my fault if my hand's off? Johnny! You want to row or not? Yes, sir. I'll roll. Okay, son. Hop to it. Johnny. Uh... Sonny. If I did something... Come on. Down to the other end of the boat, will you? Here. Sit here. I see, Andrews. That boy's hand. Quiet. He's, he's upset enough. But Bill, the palm of Johnny's hand. Good Lord, man. It's all covered with a thick growth of hair. Okay, Jim, this is your room. Hmm, say, this is fine. You say you built this yourself, Bill? Yep, every bit of it. How do you like my island? Oh, I think it's perfect, but uh, pretty inconvenient. Oh, I don't mind. Sorry we had to arrive here so late. I'll show you around in the morning. Yes, I'm anxious to see the rest of your place, Bill. I want to talk to you more about your work. Yes, of course. Tomorrow... It's pretty late now. Yes, it is late. So I'm, I'm afraid I rather bored you, old man, with my chatter at the dinner table. Oh, Jim, you heathen. You've never bored me a minute in all the time I've known you. <laughs> oh, that man Rayfield of yours is certainly an excellent cook. Yes. He's an excellent tutor for young Johnny, too. You'll find him quite helpful if you want anything. Fine. Oh, by the way, the people in this spot are a superstitious lot, Jim. Don't let them bother you with any of their nonsense. Nonsense. Yes. Yeah. A silly rot about, well, uh, things in the night. What thing? Oh, there's nothing, of course. But they take all sorts of means to ward off, well, the evil spirits. Oh, oh I see. Here, I'll, I'll set this charm here on your desk. You won't be using the desk. Charm? And... What charm? Well, it's just a simple thing that the people hereabouts always insist on putting in the room in which a person sleeps. Here, are these three bits of green twigs... Two of them standing upright, like this. There we have it. Hey, what is this? One cross piece on the uprights, like this. Then a lakeshore pebble. This little bit of charred wood. There you are. <laughs> now you're, you're fully protected. Protected <laughs> against what? Why, those evil spirits I was telling you about. And now just forget about them, Jim. I just put the charm here in case Raphael comes in. He's very superstitious, and he'll never rest until he's made a charm for you himself. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, but I still... Now, just forget all about it. Just a whim of Raphael's. Good night, Jim. Night, old man. See you in the morning. Right. Bright and early. You need a spare blanket. There's one in the closet there. Right, Bill. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Hmm. A whim of Raphael's, huh? Three bits of green twig, a lakeshore pebble, and a piece of charred wood. Hmm. That's a strange combination. To ward off evil spirits, so Bill claims. But what evil spirit? 
Great horn toads, what's that? What in the world is that? Bill! Bill, I say, Bill, what's that howling? It is nothing, Mr. Al. Huh? Oh, you, Raphael. Nothing but a wild animal. Howling in the night. What? That sounded like a wolf. <clears throat> wolf, Mr. Al. Yes. It couldn't have been a wolf. There are no such animals in this country, you know. I know that, but... There. You hear it? It, it, it will be all right, sir. Did Mr. Andrews give you the charm? Charm? Oh, yes, the charm. It will protect you, sir, from anything. Wait a minute, Raphael. Don't go. Just what is this? Thing I'm being protected from. Oh, nothing. Nothing, sir. Nothing at all. People around these parts are curious about the soul. Superstitious, you know, and all that sort of thing. So we humor them by always keeping a charm in the sleeping rooms of our homes. Yes, but I don't see why you should worry about humoring anybody. Way out here, alone like this, on this well, island. Well, sir, it is just the habit of Mr. Andrews' arrack. But he said it was you he was satisfying by placing the charm in my bedroom. Yes, sir. That is, well, what, what I mean is, sir, I'll best be going. Young John isn't feeling so well tonight. I hope you sleep good, Mr. Howard. And don't worry about the howling. Nothing will harm you. Hmm. Don't worry about the howling, eh? That's strange. That howl's coming from the east wing of this cabin. Right over there. By George, I'm going to skirt this place and have a look. Uh, quiet now. Not a sound. A light just went on in that room the sound's coming from. That window's heavily barred. And the window glass is frosted and curtained so no one can see inside. The howl is coming from inside that room. Here's the door to the place. Oh, Bill. Bill, are you in there? Bill. Some animal in there, all right. Bill. Andrews, are you in there? Whatever it is, it's trying to get out. Bill! Bill, are you all right? Are you in there, old man? Bill, are you in there? Bill! Yes, Jim? What is it? I... I just wondered if you were all right. I heard that animal howling, and I thought that... Animal? What animal, Jim? Don't tell me you didn't hear it. <laughs> you weren't by any chance dreaming already, were you, old boy? But... The howling came from inside that room. Say, you have been hearing things. I certainly have. <laughs> and just before you opened the door, I heard an animal sniffing and whining and scratching at the door. Oh, now, Jim. A joke's a joke. But I'm not joking. Well, come on inside and look for yourself, then. Does anybody use this room? Certainly, it's young Johnny's. He and Bill Jr. had the room together before... before we lost Bill Jr. Bill... I'd swear there was an animal in here a moment ago. <laughs> Normally, Jim, I'd be a little confused by what you're saying. Well, the long trip, the worry about your baby daughter... Look, look, there on the door. Long, deep scratches, like an animal's nails would make. Oh, oh those. Jim, those marks are ancient. The boys used to own a collie dog. We don't have him anymore. We used to shut him up in here sometimes, and he'd scratch on the door for someone to let him out. Now what's this? Bill, what is this? A long, heavy chain... Securely fastened to the metal bedpost. And a huge leather collar on the other end. Yes. That was the collar's chain and collar. We, well, we've never removed it from the bed. We'd chain the dog here at night to protect the boys. But look here. Fresh blood stains on the collar. And little wisps of grayish fur. Jim, forget it. Those stains aren't fresh. That dog hair has probably been there for ages. Yeah. yeah I suppose so. But why the bars on the windows, Andrews? Just a protection for the children. Come on the living room, old man, and 
Let me get you a drink. Call it a night, shall we? Yes. So I suppose we'd better. Maybe a little sleep will do everybody a lot of good. Angela, I can't tell you how happy I am to have you and Jim here to visit me. Oh, we've looked forward to this for six months, Bill. I envy Jim for having a week's head start on me. <laughs> oh, we really like it here, Bill. Uh, baby asleep, dear? Yes. And it's time we had some rest, too. And that's my hint to clear out. Oh, no. no. <laughs> oh, I forgot. I'm going over to the mainland. I'll be back by morning. Anything wrong, Bill? Oh, no, not a thing. Jim, may I ask a favor? Certainly. That watch charm you're wearing. Solid silver, isn't it? Why, well, yes, it is. Do you think you could give it to me? Give it to you? <laughs> Why, of course. I have a very special reason for wanting it. I wouldn't ask for it if I didn't have. Here you are. Thanks, old man. I... I hope I can return it to you. Well... Good night. See you tomorrow. Good night, Bill. Jim. Why does Bill act so strangely? I... I don't know, dear. Hmm. I wonder why he wanted that silver watch charm. Odd. Oh, oh, by the way, you said you had that wire for me. Oh, yes. It's here in my purse. I'll get it for you. Would you cover Sandra, dear? She's kicked her blanket off. Oh, sure. Here you are, darling. Thanks. Hmm. I say, Angela. Yes, dear? Listen. In answer to your cable... I have been able to learn that the grandfather of William J. Andrews was shot in France almost half a century ago by an angered mob. His grave was recently opened, and instead of the remains of a man, investigators found the almost perfectly intact body of a strange beast, somewhat resembling a wolf. Jim, no! Just quiet. Oh, Jim, what's that? Something's wrong. Come on, hurry. Oh, look. Look down the doorway of that room with the bars at the windows. Some animal running off there near the edge. Jim. I hit that creature three times. I couldn't have missed him. And yet the bullets didn't even slow him down. Ah, oh, Jim. There, the doorway. It's Rafael. Look at him. Oh, he's... Throat. <laughs> Only an animal could have done a thing like that. Why, Jean Johnny? Look, Jim. That heavy chain hanging from the bedpost. The collar's gone. Chain snapped right in two. Angela. You and I have a job to do. I. I hate to ask you to do this, but I think you've got the courage. To do what, dear? Come along with me. You will see. About ready to get the lid off the box now? Oh. Steady, Angela. Steady. Oh, this thing's terrible. Desecrating Bill Jr.'s grave like this. Digging up the casket. If I'm wrong about this. Well, we see. Hand me that bar. That's it. Now. Hold the light over here now, Angela. Just another nail or two. Jim. Just exactly what I thought. That's not a boy's body in that casket. It, it's what was, Bill Jr. But look. Woolly fur all over it. And that head and face. Like a dog's. Like a wolf's. <gasps> oh, Jim. Young Bill Jr. died 
a werewolf. His great-grandfather before him had the same disease. That's why Bill Jr. died so mysteriously. That's why Andrews had to leave the mainland to move out here. And all the while, he's been studying, trying to effect a cure. The hair on the palms of young Johnny's hands. Not wanting me to shake hands with him. Now I see why Bill was so insistent about the charm of twigs, stone, charcoal. My watch charm. A silver bullet. Jim. That howl again. That, that's coming from our room, Jim. Come on, hurry. Hurry. Look, there's no light in the room. We left it on, didn't we? Oh, yes, we did. Oh, Jim, hurry. There, the light went on. Look out, dear. Let me in there. Oh, locked. This door's locked. Who's in there? Open this door. Open up. Oh, Jim, Jim. Open up this door. Open up, I said. Everything's finished now. Young Johnny is dead. Friday the 13th. And you have heard Scott Bishop's 13th original tale of dark fantasy. W is for werewolf. Ben Morris was heard tonight as Jim Howard. Garland Moss was Bill Andrews. Eleanor Naylor Corrin took the part of Angela Howard. Fred Wayne was Raphael. And Don Stoltz played young Johnny. Next Friday night at the same time, listen to the 14th in this series of dark fantasy dramas. An intriguing, exciting story called A Delicate Case of Murder, written by Scott Bishop. A strange, weird tale of a spiritualistic medium who suddenly finds herself in the midst of a vicious and well-planned murder plot with herself the victim. Murder and fantasy combine to produce one of the most eerie adventures you have ever heard in A Delicate Case of Murder. Tom Paxton speaking. Dark Fantasy comes to you each Friday night from WKY, Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Oh.
out for the devil and Mr. O. so that if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. This is Mr. O. R. Jobler. Vacations is our grisly subject for today. Now, vacations can't be grisly, you say? Well, hold off your judgment until after you hear... Vacation with Death, which begins after a word from your station. In a sanctum mystery. Hello, this is your host, welcoming you through the squeaking door. Not for a half hour of terror but to tell you about Radio Nostalgia Magazine. Radio Nostalgia Magazine is a must for old-time radio fans. It's the magazine with many photos and stories of old-time radio and its stars. Our current issue features a 16-page article on The Shadow. All subscribers will get a free Captain Midnight decoder badge, a Captain Midnight Flight Patrol membership, and a Flight Commander certificate from the Secret Squadron. To get your copy, send $1.50 in check or money order to Radio Nostalgia, Box 8007R, Union City, New Jersey, 07087. That's Radio Nostalgia, Box 8007R, Union City, New Jersey, Zip 07087. Send now and get a free 8x10 photo of the Lone Ranger in Tano, boys and girls. This is Mr. O once more. It's amazing, isn't it, how very cautious people, you know, the sort who carry umbrellas when one cloud appears in the sky, throw all of that caution to the wind when they go on a vacation. They get too close to the edge of the Grand Canyon or to the top of Yosemite Falls, or they rent a country cabin meant for nothing human with no questions asked. Uh, By the way, if you haven't turned out your lights yet, turn them out now and listen to Vacation with Death. Fifty, sixty, and twenty is eighty, and twenty is one hundred. Perfectly correct. One hundred dollars rental for two months. And now there's the matter of a receipt, of course. If you don't mind. Oh, no, 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 no. Not at all, not at all, not at all, Mr. Cook. Do business in a business-like way is my motto. We're not a very large firm, but service supreme is our motto. Now, what did I do with my receipt book? So careless of me. And... In this pocket? Oh, well, any old piece of paper will do, really. No, 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 no. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> Had it in this pocket all the time. I... I'll just sit down over there and write it out for you. Well, darling. Oh, Chuck, it's simply unbelievable. Fifty bucks a month for a furnished Grand Central Palace like this one. Beautiful. There's something wrong in the woodpile someplace. <laughs> Your figures of speech are a little mixed, husband. But the fact remains that $100 is the price we're paying. Yep. Service Supreme over there is making out the receipt with his good left hand, so I suppose it's true. Or say, where's the draft exemption? Sleeping there on the sofa. Made himself right at home pretty quickly, didn't he? <laughs> Takes after his papa. Oh, now that's libel. I never curled up on a strange sofa without. Oh, yeah. Here's Service Supreme. Uh, here we are, folks. Here we are. Money received back and proper. I uh, uh, hope you'll be quite satisfied here. Not quite. Oh, I'm sure we will be. As you can see, our boy has made himself at home already. Hmm, boy? Oh, oh, oh yes, yes. Cute little fellow. I do hope he'll be quite all right. Quite all right. <clears throat> yes. Well, I must be getting along. Business, you know. Uh, moving in at once, aren't you? Well, uh, yes, we, yes, yes, uh... yes, yes, yes. You told me you were. Uh, uh, yes. 
Well, good luck, and uh, goodbye, Mrs. Cook. Mrs. Cook. Goodbye. Bye. Well, wasn't she in a hurry to get out? <laughs> Service supreme until the moment the rent's paid, and then it's exit extraordinary. Well, I'd better go get the things in out of the car, huh? Say, I never thought we'd spend the summer in a mid-Victorian mansion, did you, dear? Dear, I'm talking to you. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. Why the pensive look? What are you thinking about? Of what that man said. What man? Oh, you mean Service Supreme? Yes. Well, what pearl of wisdom did he spout? Remember when he looked at Billy sleeping there? Sure. He said, I do hope he'll be all right. Yeah, so he did. So what? The way he said it. Oh. Say, you'll have to get some help in to clean up this place. Looks like my fraternity house used to after we threw a dance. And... Chuck! Uh, well, what are you staring at? Oh. What are you doing here? Phew, fella, you startled us. What are you doing here? Oh, Chuck, he must be the caretaker the real estate man told us about. Oh, yeah, You sure. answer me. Chuck, what's the matter with that man? Well, look here, old man. You don't have to throw any cat fits. We rented this place from the service supreme. I mean, uh, what's his name, Mr. Hawkins, that real estate man up in town. Rented? Here's the receipt. A hundred dollars for the next two months. <gasps> two months? Yeah. Well, I know it isn't much, but... That's all the fellow wanted, so that's all he got. Of course, with all due respect to your caretaker. Oh, you are the caretaker, aren't you? Yes, I. Oh, good. Then I, I can speak freely. Well, I was, as I was saying, the, the rental doesn't seem like much, but after all, big as it is, this is a pretty crummy old place. Oh, Chuck. Well, it is. And that real estate fellow said there hadn't been anyone living here regularly for 20 years since those people, what's their name... All died, so I figured that the price... And... Huh? What'd you say? What'd you... I don't know. Are you frightened? Reynolds, Mr. and Mrs. and Paula. Oh, Reynolds. Yeah, they're the people that lived here, aren't they? Mr. Hoos's real estate said something about Get this. out of here. What? Get out of here. Chuck, you hear me? Now, wait a minute. Get there. out. Wait a minute. Out. You do not belong oh, wait, here. We rented Get this out place, of you know. here. No, no one belongs here. Why? No one. It is mine. What do you... Mine, 20 years. Now mine. stop waving your arms Get out, old man. Stop Get it. out. You've got Get to go. Stop you. All you of you. Feeling. If you wake up the dead, he's making that mine, noise. I tell you. you. Now look here, old man. We... My house, mine. We... Nobody. We... Get the... We... <laughs> Chuck, he's sick. Catch him. Old man. Oh, man. Chuck, he's not... Uh, no, just passed out, I guess. wonder where some water is. We ought to... He's coming, too. Thought he'd popped a valve or something the way he was blowing off. Give me a hand. Put hey, him on that other sofa. Take your with. hands oh. off of me. Huh? Take your hands oh, off of me. Oh, now, look here, old man. We just want to help you. Your hands off of me. Oh, Chuck, help him get up. No. No. I am all right. I will live longer than anybody. You, you will have to get out. You will have to get out. Hey, now, wait a minute, old man. Can you imagine that old duck? Running off like that. <laughs> we did get a bargain. A house and entertainment by a cracked nut, all for $50 a month. But why was he so furious? Don't ask me. I'm no psychiatrist. Oh, well, let's not let the old crackpot spoil things. No. I'll slip him a few bucks in the morning. He'll be all right. Mm -hmm. Now, let's wake up that snoozing son of ours and... Chuck, look. Huh? He is awake. Why, you little rascal, you. How long have you been sitting there watching, young man? A long time. Where are we, Dad? I'll tell you, Billy. We're in a great, big, beautiful house where you and I and Father are going to have a good time for the next two months. Isn't that good news? Well, why don't you answer your mother, Billy? Aren't you glad we're going to be staying here in the country? Dad? Yes, son? Please, let's get out of here. I'm awful scared. I wonder if he's sleeping yet. I'll go see. Be very quiet, Chuck. I will. Cherub. Chuck, keep your voice down. Oh, that air of ours is sleeping so deeply it'll take Susan's band to wake him up. 
Maybe we should have let him sleep with us this one night. And have him grow up into a lily that falls over the side of his own shadow? Oh, no, Mrs. Cook. He sleeps in that room and likes it. <laughs> anyway, he's deep in sleep, so that's that. And here I go. Boy, stretching out feels good. You know, it's going to take at least two bands to wake me up tonight. Lock all the doors? Mm-hmm. And the windows? Yeah. Are you sure? Oh, now listen, honey. Oh, please tell me. I am telling you. This house is locked up tighter than a who's got. Shutters, doors, everything. And tell you that crazy old coot decides to come back to continue his oration. You're going to have to use a hacksaw to get in. I wish it was morning. Hmm? You could sort of straighten things out with him. After all, he is a caretaker. Oh, forget it. We rented the place from the accredited agents, and the old boy doesn't like it. Well, that's, that's too bad. Let's go to sleep. But, Chuck. Oh, I am. But I want to know. What? Why should he have gotten so excited? It, it's it been worrying me. Mm, I don't know. Maybe because he thinks we'll mean more work. Twenty years alone. Huh? What'd you say? I was just wondering why this place hadn't been rented or sold all these years. I don't know. Could it be... What? Nothing. Say, are you thinking of... Nonsense. Is it? Sure. Just because a house is big and old and hasn't been lived in for a long time doesn't mean that... Oh, I tell you that storybook stuff. Chuck. What? Why did Billy say that he was frightened? Oh, he's just a little kid. Well, isn't it possible that young children are... are closer... To what? To things that aren't of this world... And cook. I was just thinking. Well, stop thinking things like that. All the screwy ideas to get in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. Now, oh, come on. Go to sleep. Before you give me the jitters, too. Save the ghost talk for tomorrow morning when the sun's shining. It's a little dark and visible and weird right now to be talking about ghosts. Chuck, listen. Music. Oh, Chuck. It's... It's not the radio. Chuck, I'm frightened. I knew something was wrong here. I knew it. The old man was right. We shouldn't no, have no, come here. We shouldn't have. I knew it the minute there I saw him. I want to go, Chuck. Please, do I don't want to like stay here. We shouldn't Wait, have come here. Stop. Please. It stopped. So quiet now. Yes. Oh, Chuck. Did we really hear him? I felt the floor vibrating. Like it does when the organ plays in church. <laughs> it's Billy. Yeah. Billy! <laughs> He's all right. Billy. Come on, Mom, Dad. There's no one with him. <laughs> Billy. Billy, why are you laughing like that? Why, Billy? Oh, because I've been having fun. Gosh, what's the fun? <laughs> oh, a dream, son. You, you mean you've been having a funny dream? <laughs> Gosh, no. Not a dream. Isn't my dad funny, old lady? <gasps> old lady? Who who did you say that to, Billy? <laughs> she wants me to go downstairs with her to listen to the music. Music? But I told her I couldn't go. Not unless you said I could go. Can I, Mom? Can I go? Go. Go where, Billy? Over where? Downstairs, like I told you. With her. Billy, listen to me. Who are you talking about? Son. Answer your mother. Who are you talking about? Yes, and why are you staring at the foot of the bed? What are you looking at? The old lady, Dad. Don't you see her sitting there? Old lady? Darn. Gosh. Can't you see her? Funny old lady. You can kind of see right through her.
on your station before we return to Vacation with Death. Can you use $10,000 cash? New Jersey homeowners can borrow up to $10,000 or even more. How? Your home is sure to be worth more today than when you bought it. The present resale value of your house, less the amount you owe on your mortgage, is your equity. That equity gives you power. Power to borrow up to $10,000 or more through Provident Investment Corporation. You can use the money for a business investment, consolidation of debts, home improvements, purchase of a car, new furniture, college expenses, or even a wonderful vacation trip. And payments can be stretched out over many years, small enough to fit your budget. So if you are a New Jersey homeowner, call 488-3030 anytime, day or night. That's 488-3030. All information by phone. Just one visit to our offices to pick up your check. So call 488-3030. That's 488-3030. And now, back to our story of Vacation with Death. <laughs> Cold, dear? A little. Let me get this around you. Tons of wind blowing in from someplace. We should have stayed upstairs where... No, no. I couldn't stay up in those horrible bedrooms. We couldn't. Now, don't get upset again. Here we three are, and here we stay. Until daylight... Won't it ever get light? Oh, no, honey. Just a few more hours. Gosh, kids are wonderful. What? Billy, look at him there. Sleep as if nothing had happened. He doesn't know that anything did. Oh, you just wait until that old son starts doing this stuff. I'm going to turn this house upside down until I find out what... Chuck, uh, wait. Something? I don't know. I thought I heard something sad, dear. That horrible music again. It's here. An organ. Right in this room. But where? Where is it coming from? Where? I don't know. Oh, I can't stand it. I can't. Don't make them stop it. Or you can play. No please. one can Control yourself. Stop it. You'll wake stop up the boy. Stop it. Yes. I'm a mom. Billy, he's up. Mom, come to me, Mom. Oh, yes, Billy. Yes, Billy boy. Yes. What is it? That funny music. Where is it coming from, Mom? I don't know. But, Mom... It's all right, son. Stay here by me. That's the boy. Won't it ever stop? Oh, daylight ever come. I wish you were here. Chuck, it's getting darker. It's... It, it's all right. Just... Just the dark before the dawn. You know. Dad, it's getting light. The music's dying away. Light. But what a strange light. Dan, is there something wrong with my eyes? No. I see it, too. The wall over there. The light growing on it. Oh, Chuck, I'm afraid. We've got to get out of here. Quickly. Yes. No, no. Wait. That wall. The light's gone through it. Beyond it. There's a room there now. A room. Yes. Yes, I see it, too. Chuck, what is this? Mother, what are you afraid of? There's someone sitting in that room. Yes. It's... It's a girl. <gasps> I see her so clearly. And yet... Somehow it isn't real, is it? Look at the way she's dressed. So strangely. So clear. And yet it's more like a... Like a picture on the wall. No depth. The flatness, the picture. Chuck, look. Man coming into that terrible light. By George, it's he. What? Don't you recognize him, the old caretaker? Yes. But now he isn't so old. Oh, get me out of no, here. No, wait. We don't dare go. Not yet. Pictures on the wall. And yet not pictures. He's going closer to her. I see it. Hello, Paula. He's, he's talking. Oh, and yet he hasn't flesh. I know he hasn't. Oh, it's you, Mr. Elton. Yeah, Pictures Paula. Pictures talking as if... Like talk am I insane? No, Mr. Elton. Mother doesn't want to have me talk with you. Because I am a gardener. Oh, Chuck, you don't talk. Whatever's the reason, Mr. Elton. You shouldn't come in here when Mother's way. Blast your mother. Mr. Elton. I say blast her. I've got nothing, so I am not good enough. Please go. Your papa, before he dies, promised me money 
Nancy Monday for all I did for him. I'm sorry you didn't do it. Martha. It wasn't in the will. How could she give it to you? Your papa, Mr. Reynolds, he promised me. Reynolds, they're the people that own this place. Mr. Hawkins said they'd all been been dead for 20 years. You would drive me out too, eh? No, please. If I had the money your papa promised me, you wouldn't tell me to go. Maybe you would love me. No, please. But you could love me anyway, Father Reynolds. I make you love me. Make you love me. Daddy, what is it? Moving pictures? You found me. You're right. Fading out. And they're... They're going with it. Oh, what have we seen, Chuck? What? Wait. The light. It's coming back. Don't look, Billy boy. Here, put your head against Mother. And... Look. He's... Killed her. Oh, Chuck. Standing over her. That horrible look on her face. Chuck, another woman's coming in. The mother. He's turning toward us. Chuck, he's going to kill her, too. I I can't move. I want to scream. I can't. <coughs> do something, Chuck. He's killing the mother. Killing her. What can I do? I can't move. <coughs> Gone. The light goes, and they go with it. But, but we saw him kill them. Oh, mother and daughter. Billy didn't see him. No. He buried his head against me so tightly that... Why, Chuck? What's the matter? He's asleep. Asleep? Yes. So quietly against me. It is if someone out there didn't want him to see that horror. Only you and I. Oh, Chuck. What was it that we saw? What? Whatever it was, we're getting out of here. Quick, give me the boy. Me? <gasps> Who the... The old man, the one we just saw kill... The one you just saw what? You killed them. How? Why, I don't quite understand. But we saw you kill them. Mother and daughter. Oh? Was it real? Yes. I killed them both. <gasps> yes, I killed them. And why not? The young one gave me no love. The old one, no money. He promised me. He promised me. But when he died, they gave me nothing. Killed him. Yes. Yes, killed him with my own hands. I killed him. Shock the police. Yes, no. I'm going to... No police. There were no police then. There will be no police now. But murder. Two women. They know. I know. And now you know. No one else will oh, ever... Oh, what do you mean? Did you hear? They understand. That horrible organ music. Their music. Night after night since I killed them. Now you know why I didn't want you here. Now you know why I must kill you. Kill? That gun! Yes, with the gun. Them 20 years ago with my hands. You with this gun. You crazy... No, what you kill you! Look out! Here you are. Give me that gun. 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 It, it seemed to turn in my hand toward him. As if... As if someone... I saw... Billy, is he... Still sleeping. Sleeping. Through all that. Blessed sleep. The wall! It's falling out! <laughs> the wall. It... There's the organ. The organ that was playing... And, and women. Two women sitting at the keyboard. No, no, Chuck. Don't go closer. Oh, no. Chuck, what is it? No. I was wrong, Ann. Wrong? Not women. Not anymore. Two skeletons in dresses. Oh. I... I think I know now. He killed them 20 years ago. 
then walled up their bodies in there with the organ. But what we saw, the music, how could it... Em, look. They're crumbling. Bones into dust. He's dead. Now they can have peace. This is Mr. O. R. Jobler. Well, friend, if you want a rational explanation for the return of the dead, don't expect it from me. I conceive the stories, I write them, I bring them to you. And if you want facts on ghosts, well, I'm just not in the mood. You see, last night as I was driving up to my ranch, I passed a graveyard and, well, no, I think I'd much rather talk about our next play with the very provocative title of The Hole. After a message from your station. Uh, Mr. President, what does it mean to say love makes all things new again? Love makes all things new again? Well, you see, if somebody's down in the dumps, that means they're very sad. I'd say, I care about you. And then they go, Pee-yo! Why is that? Well, when a person knows somebody cares about him, they just feel great. They just go, Pee-yo! Oh, I see. No, that's the same thing as love. What's the same thing as love? Caring about people. Well, suppose there were two people down in the dumps, Mr. President. Oh, I just say, I care about you, I care about you, and go pew, pew. Suppose 200 million Americans were down in the dumps, Mr. President. I say, I care about you, 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 I care about you. Love makes all things new again. Hey, what was that? Another sound of love from the Franciscans. This is Mr. O again. A few years ago, one of our very large industrial companies came out with what could well be the ultimate glue. One small drop between surfaces, and you couldn't pull them apart with an elephant. <laughs> I know. I've tried, and it wasn't easy to get the elephant. So after trying that glue... With my involuted mind, I began to think, what if somebody came up with the ultimate solvent, one that could dissolve anything? Of course, the problem would be that you couldn't find a bottle that would hold it if it would dissolve everything. But out of that grasshopper thinking came the play that I'm bringing you next week, The Hole, A Hole Without End, <laughs> next week. <laughs> Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Plays no favorite. It could happen to you.
Book 74, page 309. In the Diary of Fate. Yes, here it is. The name Trina Crowley, housewife. A record with little to distinguish it until toward the end of the page. And there the notations become more crowded, more distasteful. For 23 years, Trina Crowley has lived on this earth. And now she sits sobbing alone. For in a few moments, she will start her walk to the gas chamber, cursing me, fate, for the bonds of circumstance I wove around her. In a moment, I will read from her record in The Diary of Fate. I hope you'll understand. Put that phone down, Jake. The gun. So you knew about the money in the trunk. That's just what I thought you Drop that phone, Jake. Give me that gun, Trina. Stay where you are. Trina, give me that... Oh, Jake. For six years, Trina had been married to Jake Crowley. And she felt but a certain affection for him. To Trina, Jake had come as an answer to her prayer the means by which she could escape the humdrum life of Redland. But the wonderful lodge, which Jake owned in the mystic Mojave, had become a dusty auto court in the stifling desert. But let us go back to a June morning, the last day of the tourist season. Until November, you and your husband would be alone, Trina, merely existing until cooler weather allowed you to open again. You were having breakfast with Jake, thinking of the ordeal of surviving the lonely months ahead. Eight o'clock. Eight in the morning and it's so hot already you can't breathe. Is there more coffee? No. Jake, why don't we get away somewhere this summer? Jake, do you have to read the paper while I'm talking? Says here a guy up in Pendleton. Jake, got... listen to me. I'm sick and tired of all of this. The heat, the spiders. So why don't we get a change and go away somewhere? Like we used to. We could have fun, Jake. Look, Trina, we can't go away and that's final. We have some fixing up to do. We don't have money enough to go away. We do. We don't. Now, will you let me read the paper? If you're going to read, you might at least let me have some of the paper. Oh, for goodness sake, here. Oh, never mind. It's not that important. Crowley life. <laughs> Nothing but a shack in the desert. Wish I were in Bessie Halton's shoes. Maybe it's a good thing you're not. Why? Listen to this. Uh, Bessie Halton, owner of the Halton Lodge Mojave, is believed to have disappeared. It is thought she was on her way to the bank with deposits from the lodge. When last seen, she was with the Tall, handsome man, about 35. Uh, police suspect that... Oh, that's a lot of hooey. Uh, what do you mean, hooey? She had $20,000 with her. If I know Bessie, she'll do all right. She'll turn up. Uh, the police are all wrong. Huh? She's probably gone off somewhere, having the time of her life. Jeez. Paper here says a tall, handsome stranger. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you play around with strange men. Oh, for goodness sake, Jake. She'll turn up someplace. And then crow about the wonderful time she had on her trip. If I know Bessie, she'll turn up. As the day wore on, you forgot about everything, didn't you, Trina? Everything except the heat and your growing resentment toward your husband. It was growing dark as you and he sat at the dinner table in silence. And then a car pulled a stop outside. Remember? Jake, there's someone outside. I heard it. 
Whoa! Oh, looking for a room? Well, yeah, I was. You're not closed, are you? Closed tomorrow. This is our last day for the season. You got something I can have for the night? Ah, uh, three A is open. It's the only one. It's uh four fifty. That's good enough. Glad I found your place. I'd like a shower after a hot day like today. And I didn't really see the idea of driving all night. Well, if you want to go right to your room, you can come back to the office and register later. Thanks, I'll do that. Uh, say, Mr. Barton. Uh, look, I'll drive your car down, Mr. Barton. You might as well register now. Oh, that's okay. I'll drive down myself. Well, I just... What's the matter? Something wrong? Well, to tell you the truth, you see, this close to the end of the season, we, we get paid in advance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fifty dollars. Hey, just a minute, I'll get the change. What's the matter, Jake? Who was that? Old guy named Barton driving a new Packard. Well? I'm going to put him in 3A. He uh, gave me a 50. A $50 bill to pay for a $2 room? I told him it was four fifty. Yeah, Trina. Hmm? There's blood on the seat of his car. Oh, well, now you're playing Sherlock Holmes. Okay, okay, be smart. I tell you, it's blood. Something funny about that guy. Oh, Jake, stop making... And as soon as he gets settled in 3A, I'm going to have a look at his car. There, see it? Now what do you got to say? It, it does look like blood. I knew there was something phony about Barton. That's why I got him to pay in advance. You looking for something? Ah, <gasps> uh, hey, we just noticed there's blood on the seat of your car. At least it looks like it. It is blood. I cut my hand on the windwing. <laughs> Bandaged it with my handkerchief. Not too good, but it'll do. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Mrs. Crowley. We just came down to see if there was anything you wanted. No, no thanks. Uh, say, I see you got a trunk in the back there. Want some help with it? No, I'll uh, leave it in the car, thanks. I'll be glad to help you into the cabin with it. You must have a lot of clothes in it. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, they're ties. Ties? That whole big trunk? I'm traveling for the Swerdling Tie Company. Those are samples. Are you sure you don't want anything? Oh, everything's fine, thanks. Don't worry about me. I'll be okay. If you want anything, Mr. Barton, be sure to let me know. <laughs> As you walked back to the office with your husband, you thought about his stupidity, about the heat, about his childish imagination, and about the handsome Ralph Barton. As you sat down and lit a cigarette, you realized Jake was talking. And that routine about cutting his hand on the wind wing. Trina, there's something funny about all this. If Mr. Barton says that's how he cut his hand, that's how it was. He doesn't look like he'd lie. That trunk. Why should he leave the trunk out in the car? He said there were ties in it. Ties. You ever saw a whole trunk full of ties? Trina. What? Look down there, down the drive to 3A. Why, it's Mr. Barton. He's carrying his trunk inside the cabin. Trina. Bessie Halton's lodge isn't too far from here, you know. What are you trying to build up to? Well, Bessie Halton has disappeared. And they said a tall, handsome stranger. It's, uh, it's Mr. Barton, if that's his name. He's a tall and handsome. Trina, that trunk father. You're not thinking that... I don't know, Trina. I don't know. <laughs> The next morning, Trina, Jake was outside, working on the water pump in the shed. Looking up, you saw Barton walking toward the office. And you put a hand up to brush back some unruly hair. Straighten your dress. As he entered the office, you noticed his eyes weren't sun bleached like Jake's. They were deep and blue. Well, good morning, Mr. Charlie. Last night, your husband said you were closing up for the season. Yes. Well, I just wondered if it were an absolute deadline. I'd like to stay on a while if I could. Well, we officially told that uh, I suppose it... Well, according to my itinerary, I don't have to be in Carson City for four more days. And uh, I like the heat. Oh, <laughs> you like the heat here? Yes, yeah, strangely enough, I do. It's good for my sinus. And uh, there aren't too many people. I mean, I like the quiet. Well, there's plenty of that. Well, if you think it's all right, I'll just pay in advance for four more days there. My husband likes to play boss man, so you'll have to check with him. But just say I think it's okay, and I'm sure we'll be able to make an exception in your case. 
You can find them out in the shed. Good. I'll go out and tell it. You were very pleased that chance had brought into your drab existence something out of the usual dull routine you had grown to hate. Ralph Barton. Standing behind the curtains at the window, you could hear your husband talking to Barton. Well, if Trina, Mrs. Crowley, said it was all right, it's okay with me. Good. Now, there's one other thing. I'd like to put my car in the garage. Well, guests usually leave their cars out. Uh, no, but if I'm going to be here four more days, I'd like to protect it from the sun. Well, I keep my car in the garage. And to get yours in, I'd have to move a lot of stuff. Mm, it's really pretty important, don't we? I don't want to ruin the paint job. Uh, perhaps this $10 bill would make some difference? Yeah. Yeah, perhaps it would. I'll have Trina get lunch for three. Lunch is ready any time, Jake. Okay. Now, uh, before I call Barton in, I want to tell you something. I'm not going to be here to eat with you. Why? Well, all that talk about having to put his car in the garage, well, something funny about that. You just keep Barton here and keep him busy. What do you mean, keep him busy? For how long? Look, I'm going to call Barton and tell him lunch is ready. I won't be at the table. You tell him I had to finish that work on the pump out in the shed. What are you going to... Let me finish, will you? Now, you'll have to keep him busy talking and eating for at least 20 minutes. And while you two are busy eating, I'm going to have a look in that trunk. Yes, Trina Crowley. You were torn by mixed emotions. On the one hand, you were pleased and flattered by Ralph Barton's courtesy and attention. On the other hand, there was cold fear and the thought that your husband's suspicions might prove to be correct. Thoughts become the parents of the deed, but no mortal can conceal anything. All are written on the pages of time. And now, it is time for another entry on your page. When I have written... I will read from your record in The Diary of Faith. Yes, Trina Crawley, your own greed... Your evil mind would soon bring forth a decision. For while occupying Ralph Barton's attention, you knew your husband, Jake, was in the cabin trying to solve the mystery of the trunk. Something more, Mr. Barton? Oh, not another thing, thank you. When it's this hard, I don't have much appetite. Ah, but that certainly was a wonderful lunch, Mr. Charlie. It's too bad your husband missed it. Oh, he's so used to my cooking, he doesn't think twice about it anymore. Ah, uh, lucky man, Mr. Crowley. Although, uh, he be a good fly. Well, if you'll excuse me... Oh, but, but you can't go yet. I, I have some fresh berry pie for dessert. Oh, no, I've got to stop sometimes. <laughs> you'll have me wanting to stay here forever. Would that be so terrible? Uh, I think it might be fun. But I don't think the home office would approve. Let me get you that pie. No, thanks. Nothing more. I'm going back to my cat. Oh, Mr. Barton. What are you doing in here, Carly? Oh, I, uh, came down to clean up your room. Your wife said you were out back. Well, I thought I might just as well clean your room before lunch. When you clean the guest rooms, do you always try to open trunks? I suggest that you leave now. Look, Mr. Barton, you've got this all wrong. I wouldn't want anything to happen to you, Mr. Crowley. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Barton. I told you to keep Barton here at the table until I got back. Well, the man wasn't hungry. What can I do? Tie him up and force food down his throat? I tell you, I did everything I could. All right, all right. Don't blow your top. Listen, Trina, I'm convinced he's got something besides ties in that trunk. He's too concerned about it. You think Barton's a killer, don't you? I'm convinced of it. Jake, what are you going to do? I'm taking the car, going into Mojave to get the late paper. Going to leave me here? You'll be all right. Just stay here, inside. You can keep an eye on Barton. 
If there's a reward, I want it. Jake. What? Jake, what do you think really is in that trunk? I think it's the body of Bessie Hawkins. <laughs> And so, Trina, your husband left for Mojave. He wouldn't be back for over an hour. And you were alone with Ralph Barton. Again, you had that same mixture of emotions. Fear that he might be the killer. And yet, a quickening of the pulse as you thought of his attractiveness. And suddenly, a car drove up. Good afternoon, Sergeant Colfax. Good afternoon, Mrs. Crowley. Will you come in? No, thanks. Just stop by for a moment. Got some unpleasant news for you. They found Bessie Holden's body in Rock Canyon. Oh, how terrible. But they didn't find any money. The killer must have got away with about $20,000. $20,000? May have been more. But they figure Bessie Holden had at least that much and she left the large. I really came out to ask a question. About what, Sergeant? I well, wondered if you've seen any strange men around during the last couple of days. Why, uh... Well, I know you're closed down for the season, so I won't ask to see you right now. Oh, yes, we are. We're closed officially. Anyway, I noticed there aren't any cars in front of your cabin. Oh, no, no, there aren't any. Do you think this man uh, still has the $20,000? Oh, we're sure of it, ma'am. You haven't seen anyone, huh? No. No, I haven't seen anyone. Well, uh, get along then. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Sorry to bother you. Oh, no bother at all. But if you happen to see a stranger around, you let us know, won't you? You might be that guy we're looking for. Yes, I, I will. Goodbye. Bye. A stranger with $20,000. $20,000 in cash. <laughs> Yes, Trina Crowley, $20,000. Your husband was wrong then, wasn't he? There couldn't be a body in that trunk, but there could be money. You thought of this as you walked toward cabin 3A. And you were smiling as you knocked on the door of Ralph Barton's cabin. Oh, hello, Mrs. Crowley. I brought down some clean sheets and pillowcases. Oh, very thoughtful of you. Won't you come in? Yes, I, I will, thanks. I guess Jake was a little out of line. Oh, that. <laughs> I'd forgotten. Guess I blew up. Well, I'm glad the pretty member of the Crowley family forgives me. You see, Jake's so tied up in this murder that Murder? He's... The Bessie Halton murder. Surely you knew about that. Well, I did read something about her disappearance. I wasn't too interested. Jake was. And did. Really. He went into town to get the late papers. Wants to see if they've caught the killer yet. Oh. You think they have? No. And I think he's too smart to get caught. It's a long drive to Mojave. They could be gone an hour or so. Oh. Uh, Trina. Yes? Wasn't that a police car that came in a while ago? Yes, it was. The officer wanted to know if there had been any strangers around here. But I told him there hadn't been after all, you're not a stranger now. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. They found Bessie's body in Red Rock Canyon. But they didn't find any money. The man who killed him must still have it with him. Twenty thousand dollars. Twenty thousand is a lot of iron men. What would you do if you had twenty thousand dollars? Oh, I don't know, Trina. Why? Oh, I was just thinking. The guy that got that money isn't going to have a worry in the world. Do you suppose he has a girl? Oh, I wouldn't know. Mm, she's lucky. You know, I'd do anything for $20,000. Or half of it. Anything? Mm, I might even kill for it. <laughs> That's pretty broad, isn't it? Well, if you had that money, if I say, would you take me away with you? You're uh, married, remember? I'm pretty, aren't I? I know, Ralph. Well. Yeah, let's not get involved in something. Please, please. Trina. Trina, that, that shouldn't have happened. That shouldn't have happened? Why? Why? You're a very attractive girl, Trina, but you're married. Why couldn't you? Let's take driving him now. Come on, we'll walk out and meet him. Mr. Ralph. Hello, Mr. Crowley. 
Back early, huh? Yes, sir. Picked up a paper at Benson Corners. Uh, didn't have to go all the way to Mojave. What's the matter, Jake? Uh, come into the house, Trina. I want to talk to you. And, uh, Mr. Barton? Yes? You can wipe that lipstick off. <laughs> And the minute I leave, you make a pass at Bart. Look, Jake, it was just one just of the... Just one of those things. Yeah, yeah, I know. I understand you, Trina. It was perfectly harmless, Jake, really. That man in 3E is probably the murderer. And you say making love to him is perfectly harmless? I wasn't making love to him. He grabbed me and kissed me. And then you came in and... You're sure you're not thinking about the 20 Gs in that trunk of his? The papers say the police found the body, but not the money. So, uh, he's got the money. And I'm going to turn him in. What are you going to do? Phone the police. Tell them where this guy is. Don't do it, Jake. What do you mean? That man's a killer. Put that phone down, Jake. The gun. So you knew about the money in the trunk. That's just what I thought you... Drop that phone, Jake. Give me that gun, Trina. Stay where you are. Trina, give me that... Oh, Jake! You stood there, terror-struck for a moment, Trina. And then the gun fell from nerveless fingers. Your husband was dead at your feet. You'd kill him. I heard a shot. What well, happened? he's dead. Jake said I shot him. Trina, what do you mean? Darling, we've got to get away. But listen, Trina. Don't you understand? Jake said we've got to get away. But I can't. You've got money, lots of money. We can go away, far away. Maybe Mexico. Trina, listen to me. You've got more money in your trunk than we'll ever be able to spend. Hurry. Please, Trina, let me... Money's the most important thing in the world. I've always thought so. Now I've killed you. Oh, my darling, hurry, please. I'm trying to tell you, Trina, that I don't... I love you so much, Ralph. I always have, ever since you first walked in the door. But Ralph just stood there, Trina. He wouldn't admit to having any money. And he wouldn't leave with you. And then you heard something. A car. A police car was coming in the drive. And the web was closing more tightly around you. And then you decided on a last gamble. That's the police car, Ralph. This is your last chance. If you don't leave with me, I'll accuse you of my husband's murder. You've already killed one person. The police will believe anything I say. No, Trina, I won't. Okay. Officer, Sergeant Colpack in here. Hello, Mrs. Crowley. There he is. That's the man, the murderer. He's the killer. The killer, Mrs. Crowley? He murdered Bessie Halton. Bessie? <laughs> I'm afraid there's a mistake. We found the killer this afternoon in Reno. He confessed the whole story. Oh, no. He was romancing Bessie Halton for her money when she wouldn't part with it. Well... That's not true. This man did it. I know he did it. Look in the trunk if you don't believe me. All right, Mr. Crawley. All right. Take it easy. We'll look in this trunk. Come on, mister. Let's have a look. And so the three of you, the officer, Ralph Parton, and you, Trina, went to cabin 3A. And you watched as the trunk was open. As the lid swung up, the officer looked into the depths and felt among the contents. Then he straightened. I don't know that I see anything incriminating about a trunk full of ties. Ties? They were ties. All the time. Now, officer, I think you'd better have a look in the bedroom of the other house. This lady's husband is there. Dead. Now, my hand, the hand of fate, writes the final entry. Lest any mortal should think fate unkind, cruel, or unmindful of justice that must be meted out. In a moment, I will read from the page of Trina Crowley in The Diary of Fate. <laughs>
now the plan is finished. Complete. A moment ago, a deadly pellet was dropped automatically into a liquid beneath the chair in an isolated cubicle at state prison. And now, Trina Crowley is dead. Investigation by the authorities proved beyond a doubt that Trina Crowley murdered her own husband. Ralph Barton was exonerated of all suspicion. His watchfulness over his trunk was due to the fact that twice before during his career as a salesman of men's neckwear, he had been robbed. And so I closed the book. Another page in the life of a mortal has been duly recorded in the ledger of the universe by me, faith. I, who am but the instrument in the plan. Take heed, all you who listen, and remember, there is a page for you in The Diary of Faith. <coughs> Produced by Larry Finley. Diary of Fate is a Finley transcription brought to you from Hollywood. political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises, the politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 for political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Adventures in time and space told in 
future pet. The mansion. Man has always dreamed of conquering the barrier of the atmosphere. The problem is on the drawing boards of aeronautical engineers and atomic physicists. They can calculate the power needed, the trajectories, and the equipment. On the sound stages of Hollywood, the engineers and special effects men have combined to bring that day to life. The day when the first rocket leaves Earth for outer space. Now a radio play taken from the advanced screenplay of the George Pal Technicolor production, Destination Moon. On the vast concrete strip at Drywells, Texas, the form of the rocket towers above the cranes, the loading machinery, and the scuttling trucks and jeeps. The fuel lines snake across the concrete to the rocket. Its destination, Moon. A small pursuit plane circles in for a landing on the runway, turns and taxis toward the prefab buildings at the edge of the strip. Here comes General Fair. Got those reports, Dr. Cargrave? Already, Barnes. Well, you made good time. Hi there, General. Over here. Barnes, right, I've got to talk to you. Well, you just made it, General. Everything's running smooth as a clock. We ground test in 20 minutes. Come on over to the office. What's the matter? Come on, Barnes. Something happened in Washington? Something always happens in Washington. Well, let's have it straight, General. Our application for a test license was denied. Denied? I'll quote. In the opinion of the commission, should the engine fail structurally, the dispersal of radioactive material would mean danger to the surrounding area. But we've evacuated the blast no area. No use, we... Bonds. The commission is pretty sensitive about public opinion. The Galavan newspaper chain has been after our scalp. They got mine anyway. What do you mean? I've been retired. Retired? You got a job for an ex-general? Pretty handy with a lug wrench. They can't do that. Where would the Air Force be if you hadn't kicked them into using the Jespo jet engine on pursuits? It's not as simple as all that. One star generals can't go into the Department of Defense and pound desks. I did. Mm, some of those old mossbacks would still be using horse cavalry if they could get away with it. Well, this ship will work. I know. I built it. I don't suppose we'll ever know. The mission won't reverse itself. Wait a minute. Cargraves. Ship's already, isn't it? Except for minor installations, yes. General, I've been building and flying ships by the seat of my pants since they had piano wire between the wings. Now, this baby either works the first time or she doesn't. What do you mean, Bond? The commission refused permission to ground test, right? Yeah. All right. We won't ground test. Cargraves, what's the next astronomical optimum? 3.47 tomorrow morning. We'd better get busy, then. We've got just 17 hours to get that ship ready. And then we take off for the moon. <laughs> Hey. Hey, Brownie. What do you want, Sweeney? What color is the uh, skin temperature lead wire on the chart? Orange with a black stripe. This stuff looks like insulated macaroni. Oh, I got it. Hurry up, will you? We're running behind. What's your rush? You're going along on this clam bank, aren't you? Can't you wait to break your neck? Hey, hey look out for the starter. Come on, move. We got to take off before somebody slaps a writ on us. Brownie. You ready, Gorn? Sure. Beats me. What do you want to go to the moon for? To see what's on the other side. Ask a stupid question, you get a stupid answer. What's the uh, separation rate positively? Red and white spiral. Oh, oh. What's the matter? I'm not going to bellyache. Eating green apples? No, no, I'm all right. <laughs> Come on, Swinney, get busy. We've got two hours left to patch this mess together. <laughs> Mr. Barnes. Oh, what is it, Sweeney? It's Brown. We just took him to the hospital. They what? Well, is he all right? He will be after they cut out his appendix. There goes our radio, man. But there's no chance of finding a substitute? No, it's special equipment. Brown installed it himself. I've got it. Barnes here. What? Well, we'll have to delay sure. take over a month. Okay, goodbye. We can't, General. That was Hastings at Dry Wells. There's a United States Marshal driving over. Something leaked, and he's got a court order forbidding the takeoff. 
We were so close. Yeah. <laughs> million dollars got the flu. You want me to give a stand by, Mr. Bond? I suppose. Uh, wait a minute. Sweeney. Yeah. You installed that communication equipment with Brown, didn't you? Yeah, but... Then you must know the operation. You could go in Brown's place. The moon? Uh-uh. Oh, no, not me. It's an important That's... project, Sweeney. The scientific advance... There's the military aspect, Sweeney. I had four years of the military aspect, General. That's enough. Afraid? You don't, too. That ship is safe. Maybe, maybe not. But, Sweeney... Look, you guys aren't going to get anywhere pressuring me. Maybe you got reasons to go to the moon. You, Mr. Barnes, you got a million dollars tied up in the ship. It's your scientific baby, Doc, and the general's out in a limb in Washington. Well, what's in it for me? And that's no way to talk, Sweeney. It's an important advance for the whole world. You'll pardon the expression, baloney. Sweeney. I work on a scientific theory, too, General. Hooray for me. You look out for yourself. I ain't going. I don't like to say this, but this isn't the time to consider yourself, Sweeney. This country's defense hangs on being the first to develop space travel. Somebody else, not me. There's nothing I want on the moon. All right. We'll take care of that. Sweeney, I'll offer you $10,000 bonus and a 10% royalty on the ship patents out of my cut. Barnes. It's no use to me unless we get off before that marshal gets here from Dry Wells. Well, Sweeney, you'd be rich enough to retire. You could take it easy the rest of your life. Well, now you're talking my language, Mr. Barnes. Okay. When do we leave? <laughs> Said Hastings. Right. I'll be tracking you from control center. Hey, what's that car doing? He's coming right out on the field. Marshal, Doug, General Sweeney, inside. Hey! Hey, Bond! Button her up. Hey! Hey there, Commander, that ship. I've got a court order. You can't take off. Stop, mister. You can't do this. Hey! Hey! Save your knuckles, fella. You couldn't get in that ship with a blowtorch. Burns can't do this. Suppose you tell him all about it when he gets back from the moon. Sweeney, warm up your communication service. Yes, sir. Calling traffic, Shaq. Traffic. Traffic calling rocket to Pluto. Over. Get a clearance, Shaq. There was a clearance, traffic. Over. All clear. Drywell is ready for tracking. Over. Power. Power ready. Communications? Yeah. Co-pilot, automatics ready. Give the warning signal. Give me a time check on the computer. 03-47-58. Stand by for count off and firing. Stand by for count off and firing. Roger. For check. So, 48. 10. Check. Coming up 30 seconds. 29. 28. Now lie back on the acceleration pouches. Worst pressures will be over in four minutes. Five. Five. General, four. I don't like having a man along who isn't with us. Between you too late now. Make it pretty tough. If he's half hot, we'll now. worry about that later. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, fire. What happened? Noise. All gone. That speed of sound. Switch on teleview act. Ah, I can't. Can't move. Pre pressure switches right under your finger. Go on. Ah, that's it. Time. Three fifty twelve. Altitude two miles. Get your sun goggles on it. It'll be coming through in a minute. The, there's a dawn line. Ah, and the sun. It works. This thing really works. Now look in the viewer. There's the earth down there. Yeah. Time, 351.10. Altitude, 20 miles. Time, 353.50. Altitude, 807 miles. That's the end of the blast. We're in free fall. Unbuckle your straps. Hey. Hey, I'm falling. I'm falling up. There's no gravity up here. We don't weigh anything. I don't feel so good. I don't get down from the ceiling. I feel lousy. Sea sick. No, no, space sick. What's the difference as long as I ain't healthy? Now, there's a bottle of pills under the head pad. 
They ought to settle your stomach. Now break out the magnetic shoes. Then we can at least keep our feet down on the floor plates. Here. Sweeney, you can put these on. Hand them up. All right. Here. Now you can walk down the wall. Try it. Like this? Hey. Like a human fly. You know, this is the second time I ever walked on a ceiling. Only this time I'm sober. Hey, General, would you mind tapping that ham sandwich back and float it away from me? Feeling better, Sweeney? Yeah, I guess so. It's a heck of a note when your meal floats away from me before you eat it, Sweeney. Yeah, Mr. Bronson. I tried to crank out the radar antenna. She's stuck. Well, let me see. All right. That's stuck all right. I don't understand it. I greased the good. Grease? Well, no wonder it's stuck. It's exposed to outer space. It must be frozen solid. What's the idea, Sweeney? Didn't you read the engineering manual? Yeah, and a flush fitting gets greased. Don't jump on me. Well, if we can't get that radar mast cranked out, we can't land on the moon. Well, it's all right by me. Don't you realize that half the value of this trip is in the landing? Geological surveys, radiation tests. Look, General, I told you before I started, this whole thing is slug nutty to me. Who wants the moon? They're trying to be first with the old Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Sweeney, I'll... I'll... Now, this isn't getting that mask fixed. Well, we've got to go outside in spacesuits and chip it loose. Outside? You mean outside the ship? You can't fall. You'll be in the same trajectory as the ship. Worst that could happen would be to drift away. Drift away? Don't bother getting one of them monkey suits for me. I'm comfortable in here. Sweeney, we've taken enough from you. We can't let one man endanger the whole project. You get out there in a spacesuit, or we shove you out without one. All right, all right. Well, that's settled. You got us into this mess, you're going to help get us out. General, break out the spacesuits. Close the inner lock. Now, let's get this straight. Keep your magnetic shoes on the hull plates. Your safety line's hooked. If you break loose, we won't be able to go after you. You'll hit the moon at 20,000 miles per hour and squash. Hey, wait a minute. How come General Thayer don't go? That's right. He doesn't go. He's co-pilot. Okay, okay. I just asked. All right. Now, let's make sure our intercom walkie-talkies are warmed up. All set. Check. All right. Fasten helmets. Hello. Hello, Doc. I hear you, Barnes. I'm okay. Check instruments. I'm going to go about the lock. Offset. Open the outer door, Doc. Look at that, will you? A million stars. 20,000 miles an hour, free fall and no breeze. That's right, no air. And we haven't got time for the scenery. Let's get to work. Can you two handle it? I want to go aft to see how the firing tube's held up. All right, Doc. Come on, sweetie. Let's get to work. Loose now. Pull the mask out, sweetie. Slippery as a, a hog on ice. Yeah. Well, let's get back. Suits me. That's the earth up there? Western Hemisphere. You can see America. That dark strip against the light. Pretty far away, huh? Barnes. Barnes. Sir Grace, what's the matter? Help. Help, I'm loose. I'm drifting. Stop, what happened? My, my shoe magnet's pulled loose. There he is. The safety line broke. Harry, help. He's too far to the line. Oh, he's cooked. We'll never get him back. Hello, General Thayer. All oh, right, Barnes, I heard you on the control room speaker. I'm coming outside. Bring an oxygen tank. Drop in. All right. Hurry. What are you going to do? Throw him a bottle of air to get a bottle? Barnes, Barnes, help. Now, all right, Doc. General Thayer's coming out of the lot. Where's Cartwright? 50 feet out and down to the left. Give me that oxygen tank. What are you going to do? Hey, it works. Like an outboard motor. Keep going, Mark. About 30 feet more. Swing a little to the left. All right. A couple more shots. There. Now, reach out for me, Doc. You're, you're too far. I can't. I can't. Hang on, Mark. One more shot. 
country down there. Stand by to turn ship. Fasten straps. Altitude fair. 27.3. All right. Turning ship. Hey. Hey, you're leveling off. You're turning too far. We're going backwards. We land backwards. Use the jets for brakes. Holy smokes. You mean sit down on a sail? Ground speed. 1.52. Stand by for deceleration. Now, fire. Radar. Closing is spotted. Give me a few apps on the screen. Hey, we can't land down there. Look, mountains, cliffs. That's the crater Harpalus. We're heading for a smooth plane short of there. Don't look smooth to me. I'm going to kill our forward speed. Stand by. You won't clear the mountain. Give another blast. I can't. We won't have enough power to get home. You won't make that trip on the right. Look out. We're going to crash. Barnes, blast. You've got right. Uh-oh. Automatic landing. Automatic in. Hang on for emergency landing. Stand by for the blast. Hold it. Now. Next on. Get out your gyros. Ah, <laughs> uh, that was a lousy landing. It's unsafe. Yes, but I wasted reaction mass we'll need to get home. We'll worry about that later. Right now, I want to get out there and plant my feet on the moon. The moon. Decompression lock? Check. I'm set. And you're yes. inside control, Barn? Yeah. Sure you don't want to leave the ship? I'll be out later. I've got to contact her. All right, let's go. Open the outer door. All right, be sure you don't fall. You puncture your suits on the rocks, you're done. And, and, and look out for the low gravity. You'll weigh one-sixth what you did on Earth. All right, let's go. Hey, what is this stuff? Dust? Found it, rock. Go ahead, Doctor. Claim it officially. Oh, yes. In the name of the United States of America, I take possession of the planet Moon, of and for the benefit of mankind. Well, let's now get down to business. Sweetie, you set up the astronomical Hello, camera. Bond, what's the matter? Get back here, all of you, right away. We we're just starting work. You've got to get back. I've been talking to Earth. We may not get off. We may be stuck on the moon for good. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Earth. Reaction mass down to 0.8672. Wasted power in a bad landing. Request new figures for return trip. Earth to Luna. Looks bad, Mr. Blind. I'll have to run it through the machine. In the meantime, dump everything you can. I'll check back with the result. I'll be standing by. Roger. Out. Well, Barnes? Well, we wasted too much power on that lousy landing. Hastings checked the figures. We've got the light and ship. We've got just four hours to get off. If we miss that, we don't get another chance to hit the Earth for another month. But we don't have more than ten days' oxygen supply. Exactly. Come on, we better start dumping, and we better pray we can get rid of enough weight. <laughs> Acceleration pad four, serial 706, scheduled B, 14 pounds. Check. Give me a hand, Doc. Yes. <clears throat> Airlock's full. I put my helmet on and shove the junk out of the lock. 
Franz, is that everything we can get out? Three of the spacesuits will be dropped before we take off. How about the fourth? We'll have to keep that so we can open the airlock to shove the others out. I've got a removable bridge I could dump. <laughs> you may have to, General. Well, Hastings is due back now with the takeoff figures. Hello, hello, Earth. Luna calling Earth. All right, Mr. Fine. We hear you. How much weight have you dropped? 4,003 pounds, Earth weight. Then you're still short 110 pounds. What? If you can dump 110 pounds, you can coast home. Well, we're stripped. We unbolted the locker doors, junk the radar chassis and mounts. We'll have to take a chance as we are. It's suicide. You haven't enough reaction mass to clear the move. You could be wrong, couldn't you? I could, but not the computer. I'll be standing by, Mr. Barnes. Over. All right, Hastings. Out. 110 lousy pounds. What happens if we're not light enough? We fall back and crash. Or just go into an orbit around the moon. Just keep going around? Yeah, that's it. We've got 14 minutes left till takeoff time. Oh, that's fine. I could have gone over Niagara Falls in a barrel, but I had to come to the moon. Well, it's pretty simple. 110 pounds. One of us stays. Yeah. I guess that's it. Highway 180. That's plenty. Now, wait a minute, General. I'm the oldest one here. Yeah, and I'm the captain of this ship. If anyone stays... That is not I give the orders here. Doc is the engineer. General pilots when you hit the Earth atmosphere. But, Bond... I've got no family, so I stay. No, 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 no. You, you've got to go back, both of you. I've been discredited. They won't listen to me. You've got to tell them what you've seen. Now, listen, yeah. General, You've I... got to tell them what the Earth looked like from here. Vulnerable, defenseless, hanging in the sky. I knew this trip would have military value. Well, it does. Can you imagine Adam warheads launched at Earth from up here? The moon is the perfect base for an attack on the Earth. Remember, it's only one-sixth as hard to shoot rockets from here to Earth as it is the other way. You've got to tell them the only government to control the moon must be a world government. General, I, I guess you don't know it. But what you just said means you've got to get back to Earth and convince them even if the rest of us don't make it. Barnes, don't... No, be General, that's all there is to it. Now listen, Mr. Barnes, General. Never mind, Sweeney, you're not in Don't it. worry, you'll get back. I was going to say, why don't you heroes match for it? Odd man's out. All right, Barnes, I'll go for that. I mean, no, no, no. Two to one, Barnes. Well, all right. What do we use? You can match buttons off your overalls. All right, each one pull off a button. I'd better check Hastings on Earth. Here's my button. Cargrave? Hello, hello, Earth. Standing by, Mr. Barnes. Uh, we're working it out. One of us stays behind. What? We're matching for it. Check time. Well, it's only 110 pounds. Isn't that some Check little... time. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt the program to mention X for just a moment from, for two important bulletins from the wires of United Press. From Seoul, Korea, the North Korean radio says the North Korean communist government formally declared war on South Korea, effective at 11 a.m. Sunday... Korean time. And then a little later, this bulletin from Washington. State Department officials say they will hold Russia responsible for the North Korean attack against the independent South Korean Republic, which this country and the United Nations brought into being and have supported. We now return to the program Dimension X. Yes, sir. 94150. 10 minutes to zero hour. Check. That's all, Hastings. We'll take off with three men. All right. Ready to match? Hey, what? The airlock. Brady, he went out. What's he doing? What? He's going out. Out there on the moon. Don't leave me. Now, Sweeney, wait a minute. Come on, oh, come on, Brock. Get gone. You spoiled my whole day. 
Come on, here, Arthur. You don't understand. We can take off, all of us. What do you mean? What's the 110 pounds? Now, listen to what I say. Get back in here, and on the way, pick up a screwdriver and a rat tail file and, and an oxygen tank. What's the deal? Get back in here. I've got a way to get us all off, if it works. <laughs> Sweeney, we're reading you clear on the intercom speaker. You in the airlock yet? Yeah. Well, your spacesuit weighs around 70 pounds. Radio weighs 50. Yeah, but I uh, can't open the outside door of the airlock without my suit. What are you trying to pull, Barnes? After you chuck the radio out, you file a hole in the gasket on the outer door. Got that? Then you tie your safety line to the oxygen tank, pass it through the hole. It hangs outside. You got that? Yeah. Then you close the outside door, get out of your suit, come in here. We close up, decompress, and open the outside door again. Oh, I get it. The tank pulls us so into the lock. Right. And if it works, we all get home. Now, hurry now, sweetie. Eight minutes to calculated takeoff time. Eight minutes. <laughs> Two minutes. All set, Sweeney? Yeah. Shut the radio off. Close the outer door. They have pressure up. I'm getting out of a suit. This doorway's pretty narrow, boss. If the suit don't clear, we're sunk. We'll have to take that chance. All right. Here I come. All set. Close the inner door. Decompress. Now the outer door. I ain't moving. I can see it through the floor. Coming up one minute. One minute to take off. What are the suit caught on the intake? No, 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 no. It's sliding out. Get clear of that door, brother. Get clear. There it goes. We're in. We're in. 40 seconds. Close the outer door, Sweeney. Ten minutes for take off, everybody. 30 seconds. 20 Sweeney, I... 28. I don't think I could have done that. 26. Just walk out. Oh, baloney. I haven't got that kind of courage. 23. I'd have had to make a speech. A big heroic speech. 20. Nineteen. I didn't have the guts to just walk out. No, it's sixty. All right, 15, stand by. Fourteen. Communications. Fine, fine. Five, just five, Andy. Co-pilot. 11, Automatic set. 10, nine. Stand by. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. Fire. All right, we're clear. Son of a gun. We're clear. We're heading home. Time. Two, fifty, thirty-six. Destination, Earth. You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The Lord of the Elements wants to change reality. He's enlisted the evil Zeltan to help him, and together they'll try to recruit Stanley, a man gifted with incredible imaginative capabilities to help them. Unless Edward and his friends can stop them, that is. A tale of white and black magic, quantum physics, and a plot that twists and turns. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you'll love The Last Observer a Magic Battle for Reality by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample of The Last Observer on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Helmet? But it takes years to turn a body into a skeleton. And those clothes aren't even weather beaten. Wow! A freshly made skeleton!
Here comes Monk Mayfair, the ape like chemist. Blazes! Ham Brooks, the sword wielding lawyer. Take that! Rennie Renwick, the two fisted engineer. Holy cow! Long Tom Roberts, the adventurous electrical genius. I down, you guys. Johnny Littlejohn, the fighting archaeologist. I'll be super amalgamated. And their leader, the greatest adventure hero of the 1930s, the Man of Bronze, Doc Savage. The Variety Arts Radio Theater, by special arrangement with Condé Nast Publications, presents The Adventures of Doc Savage, a new series of radio adventures based on the novels by Lester Dent. Today, Island of Death, Chapter 4 of the fantastic story, Fear Key. Doc Savage and his five aides are on the trail of the Fountain of Youth Yang, headed by a criminal named Santini and a crooked lawyer named Hallett. Santini's gang has kidnapped Doc's cousin, Pat Savage, under the mistaken belief that she is one Kel Avery, who knows the whereabouts of a mysterious package from an island in the Caribbean. Also involved is a man named Dan Thunden, who claims to be 131 years old and who apparently knows the secret of the package. During a struggle in a secluded beach shack, Doc's aide, Johnny Littlejohn, has been shot and left for dead. Santini, realizing he may incur the wrath of Doc Savage for the murder, takes off by seaplane for the mysterious Caribbean island. As today's chapter opens, Doc Savage, his aides, Kel Avery and her bodyguard, DeClima, are winging over the Caribbean in one of Doc's super speed planes. Thunderbolts. Doc, I think Johnny's coming out of it. Thunderbolts. What's that, Johnny? Thunderbolts. In my head. and my chest. Take it easy, pal. You'll be out of it pretty soon. Monk, where are we? Over the Caribbean. A good many miles off the southern tip of Florida. That's the last thing I remember is folding up in that Long Island beach shack. Say... Aren't I supposed to be dead? <laughs> nah, your bulletproof vest saved you. Of course, Doc designed to protect us only from an occasional bullet. For the look of your suit, you've got a whole gun full shot at you. So you're probably stumped. But you apparently were conscious enough to hear everything that was said around you. Doc! What do you mean? You talked when we found you. Maybe you don't remember it. Doc shot some stuff in here to make you rest. But in the meantime, he told us the whole story. What whole story? That Santini and Thunden fought over the parcel they had stolen from the postal couriers. That they found a map to an uncharted island in the Caribbean. And that they were both very disappointed to discover that the parcel contained only swamp grass instead of what they really wanted. Which was? That we still don't know. But your description of the map gave us enough to go on to follow them. I recall now. It was like a dream. Say, how badly hurt am I? Yeah, a few crack ribs. Doc says you can navigate all right, unless you jump around too much. Well, I'll be super amalgamated. <laughs> well, that means he's all right. A really sick man couldn't think of such words. Ham, you're here too? Indeed, along with the rest of the crew, plus Cale Avery and the Klima. But not Pat. No. Apparently Santini still has her, thinking she's Miss Avery, of course. What about the patriarch with the alabaster locks? Dan Thunden? Believe it or not, he hired one of the fastest planes in New York and lit out for this same part of the world. A bird named Windy Allen owned the plane and flew it for him. How did you acquire that knowledge? Windy Allen lived up to his name. He was talkative. Yeah, he was bragging around about what a swell lot of coin he was going to get for flying the old goat down to the Caribbean. Dog checked the airports as a matter of routine and got the info. So, we're over the Caribbean. Yes, Johnny. And we'll want you to point out the exact spot on the map that Santini indicated when we get closer. Doc, I just got an SOS. Where's it coming from, Rennie? The bird isn't giving his position, just the SOS. But from the sound of his fist, he's sending the letters as he picks them off a code chart. Put them on the speaker. Right. Whoever it is doesn't know the code. Let's try the directional antenna. Either northwest or southeast of us. Can't you tell near? Oh, hello, Miss Avery. No, the directional loop only shows the line of greatest intensity of the radio signals. 
The sending station is on a line drawn through our present position from the northwest to the southeast. But the only way we can tell the exact position is to take another bearing when we've gone a few miles. The radio SOS. I wonder... Wonder what, Mr. Reynolds? Uh, never mind. Monk, get a map of the area. Right. Now, Johnny, where exactly did Santini indicate the island is? Well, let's see. Well, I'll be super amalgamated. What? There's no island shown where Santini had his finger on the map. Huh? There may be an island there, you know. How so, Doc? I got in touch by radio with the hydrographic office of the Navy. They looked over some old charts of the region for me. And it seems that some ancient maps do show the presence of a tiny island in this vicinity. Does this island have a name? Yes, Johnny. Fear Key. It's queer the guy don't give his position. Anybody with gumption would know enough to do that. All he's sending is the SOS. Whoever he is, he can't be far away. Right. How can you tell? When you're close to a station, very close, that is, there's a noticeable difference in the signal. You can almost hear the key close. I say, come look. What is it? An island. Down there in the middle of nowhere. Bank her around, Renny. Right. That's probably why it isn't on any modern charts, Miss Avery. Can't be seen from a great distance. Looks like nothing but mangrove swamp and jungle with a coral reef all the way around it. Yes. Doesn't look like there's any place a boat could get through. But there is a beach all the way around it. Doc! Hey, Doc! What is it, Rennie? That SOS is being sent from here. It's coming from Fear Key. And I think I see where it's being sent from. Look! A wrecked plane. Yo! I see it. Half buried in a tangle of mangroves. Both wings are gone, and, and there's a big hole in the fuselage. And the engine's gone. Oh, no, no, there it is. About 20 yards further into the mangroves. See anyone, Doc? No, no one around. There's a small lagoon. Shall I set it down? Yes, Rennie. Be careful of the coral reef. It could slash the bottom right out of the plane. Think that Santini ship, Doc? I don't know, Monk, but one thing is sure. This is where we'll find the answer to this mysterious business. See if there's any evidence of who brought it down here. Holy cow. What is it, Rennie? C- come here, look. Oh, a skeleton. A well dressed skeleton. Khaki trousers, boots, aviator's helmet. But it takes years to turn a body into a skeleton. And those clothes aren't even weather feet. Johnny, you're the archaeologist. You're used to bones. Pull back some of the clothes. Right. Nothing but bones, Doc. But what? They're so completely bare and white. Almost like they'd been polished. Wow! A freshly made skeleton. What do you make of it, Doc? Take off the helmet, Johnny. The top of the head is caved in, as if it might have been fractured in the crash. What? You mean, Doc, you maintain that this is the pilot of that demolished aircraft? Yes, and this proves it. Here's the flight plan of the craft. Pilot's name was Windy Allen. This is old Dan Thunden's flyer. Well, I'll be super amalgamated. <laughs> radio in this crate's still warm. That means someone used it for sending, probably up until the time our plane was sighted. But who? That, Monk, is the interrogative of the millennium. There are tracks here in the sand which tell quite a bit. The ship must have been shot down by Santini and his crowd. Nan Thunder and his pilot must have been aboard. Apparently, Thunder escaped into the jungle, but the pilot got a fractured skull in the crash. Santini and his crew searched the ship and then headed off into the jungle. How can you tell all that, Mr. Savage? From the depressions in the sand. I'd recognize them from similar tracks we found around the beach shack on Long Island. And the varying depths of the depressions, plus their general direction, make it very clear. To you, maybe. But, Doc, what made the pilot lose his... I mean, left him like that? They couldn't have been here more than a few hours. What made him into a skeleton so quickly? That, as Johnny said, is the question of the century. So who used the radio? 
Sundan, obviously. Then the whole crooked crew, Santini, Sundan, and the rest, are on this island. Exactly, Monk. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to locate Santini's plane. How? From the air. And we better call the gang together and get going. Right. Look, Tom, Ham, the cleaver. Come on back. We're taking off. I wonder if Pat's all right. If they've done anything to her, I'll... I suspect she's all right, Rennie. Perhaps they still believe she's Calabri and can tell them where the real package is. Even if they know she's my cousin, they probably will hold on to her until the end. To use as a hostage, if need be. But what if they've found what they're looking for? Maybe this thing is at an end. In that case, we're... Yes, Rennie. Well, here we are. What's up? We're going to try to locate Santini's landing place. Everybody into our plane. Look! Up the beach, about 200 yards. Holy cow! Thunder! Bomb in your plane! What did he say? He said, there's a bomb in our plane! Come on! I don't get it. How could a bomb get in the plane? One of us was watching it every minute. Here it is, in the cabin pocket. Holy cow! Eight sticks of dynamite wired to flashlight batteries. And a clock set to go off in ten seconds! Come on! Get down, everybody! What a throw! Get down! <sighs> Holy cow, that was close. Come on, let's get out the thunder. Wait, Monk. Look back this way, down the beach. Yo! Santini! He's jumping up and down like a madman! He seems enraged that our plane is still in one piece. Good thing he's so far away. I hate to hear the words he's spouting. There goes Dan Sundin, back into the jungle. And Santini's beating it, too. Monk, Ham, the claimer, you stay with the plane. Johnny, you and Long Tom and Rennie get hold of Dan Thunden if you can. He and Santini are fighting each other, and I'd like to know why Thunden won't throw in with us. He warned us and probably saved our plane from that bomb. What about you, Doc? I'm going to try to do business with Santini. What about me? You stick with me, Miss Avery. You're a valuable commodity to Santini, and I want to know where you are. Dang it, Doc. Don't you want some help? You stick here, Monk. If anything happens to that plane, we'd spend the rest of our lives here. Come on, Miss Avery. Santini's heading straight across the island. How can you tell? There's still enough sand and swamp grass to make out his trail. And he seems to be following a definite path, one cleared through the jungle some months ago, judging by the shrubs that have grown up around it. I wonder how far ahead of us he is. Well, not too far, I'd say, judging from the occasional cry of birds as he passes. Having me along must be slowing you down. A little, but the island isn't very big. We'll catch up to him sooner or later. Wait. Santini. He's just up ahead. Listen. He's met the lawyer, Hallett. Look at the gun strapped across his chest and all the cartridges on his back. They're obviously expecting trouble. Then going on? Yes. Come on. Looks like they're heading into a clearing up ahead. That was Hallett. I don't know. Let's get a little closer. Look, Santini. He looks terror stricken. What was he looking at? I can't tell. Just a flat expanse of rock. Where did that come from? I can't tell. Well, it certainly affected Santini. There he goes off into the jungle looking scared out of his wits. Come on. Aren't we going to follow him? No, I want to have a look at that clearing. Interesting. I don't see anything. Just a big flat rock about 20 yards around. Yes, but Hallett's cry came from here, and so did that muffled moan. Where could he have gone? The ground's giving way. Hang on to me. Oh. 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 Mr. Savage, where are you? It's pitch black. Wait a moment. I have a flashlight. There. What happened? We evidently fell through a trap door of some kind, built into the rock above. What triggered it, I don't know. What is this? A subterranean chamber, carved out over eons by underground waters. Look, a passageway. Yes. Let's see where it leads. 
Even you will hear me now. Wait here. <gasps> that did it. Oh, I didn't hear you come back. What did you do? There's a certain spot on the back of the neck which, when pressed in a particular way, produces instant paralysis. The guard will remain helpless and speechless until I work on his neck again. Fascinating. Merely the application of medical knowledge to other necessities. Now, come on, let's continue. Mr. Savage, are you sure somebody didn't build this tunnel? The formation of the stone strata on the walls is definitely the work of the elements. But yes, it has been widened in some places by human hands. Do you smell something? Yes. I picked it up as soon as we fell through the trap. What is it? I don't know. It isn't animal, nor is it the smell of putrefaction. It's baffling. Look, there's a, there's a light ahead. Yes, I'll turn ours out. Slowly now. It's a, it's a large cavern with men making. Yes. Two of them are leaking and shorty. Two who tried to abduct me in New York. Someone's coming. It's Santini. Fermate, stop making noise. What's up, boss? Oh, che, vergogna. What a shame. Our good friend Halleck has met with misfortune. You mean that savage, Gannon? Worse than that, my perspiring friend. What you mean, worse? There was a trap door in the rock of which we knew nothing. Hallett walked in advance and uh, fell through. He, he screamed and I saw what happened to him before the trap door closed again. He, it was ghastly. And after the trap closed, I could hear him he, moan. He, he, oh, si, senors. He is a skeleton by now. Oh, oh. It's that old Dan Thunden's work. Yeah. Old Rip, he sure caused us a mess of trouble. It might have been better if we hadn't tried to double-cross him in the first place. Giving him his half split in the racket would have been better than going through what we're going through. Ah, uh, he's a spill the milk, my dear Shorty. How were we to know that old Thunder would have stealed the package containing all of the product we had and, and mail it to this, this relative of his, Kelly Avery? Kel Avery. I'm still wondering if the girl we got is really Kel Avery or that Doc Savage's cousin. We shall know the answer to that before long leaking, I promise you. Why did old Dan Dundon send the girl the package in the first place? It was undoubtedly his first step in an effort to persuade her to furnish financial backing for his project. You mean old White Whiskers is trying to market the stuff himself? See, si, that is my guess. Did you destroy Savage's plane? No, the bomb was in the plane, but Dan Thunder was watching unknown to me. He jumped out and yelled a warning to, to get the bomb out in time. Why Thunder do that? Is he working with Savage now? No, Marie. He's just the game of, of a mastermind. He hopes for Savage and his men to vanquish us. Then he will step in and eliminate the Savage. Uh, give old Pundin credit. He's got a brain. Been around 131 years. A guy that old ought to have some gray matter. Enough of this. You had better resume this search. We must find Dan Thunder's supply of the material. That old devil has a hidden it well. You think it's in this mess of caves? I'm not a certain, but it is a likely. It was in these caves that Dan Thunder dwelled for the 91 years since his ship was erected here in 1843. It is reasonable to think that he would have stored it here. Well, you may be right at that. Hey, Doc Savage is in here. How do you know? Well, the guard on the passage is laid out. He's paralyzed or something. Only that bronze guy could have done it. Allegri, search the cavern. Find him. There he is! Shoot! It's every run. Follow me! Which way? Back along the car. Perhaps there's another way out. Here's where we came in. No getting out here. Keep going. I think they're gaining on us. Look! 
Santini gang finally succeed in getting Doc Savage and his companions out of the way? Or will Dan Thunden intercede once again to save them? And what is the mysterious secret that instantly turns men into skeletons? Don't miss Terror Underground, Chapter 5 of Fear Key, next time on The Adventures of Doc Savage. <laughs> Fear Key was written by Lester Dent and adapted for radio by Roger Rittner. Featured in the cast were Daniel Chodos, Robert Towers, Art Dutch, Bill Ratner, Kimmet Muston, Marcia Kramer, Michael McConaughey, Douglas Kohler, and William Irwin. Also heard were Glenn Shaddix and Bob Wine. Sound effects were created by David Surtees, assisted by Jerry Williams. Production assistance by Samantha Kimmel and Doris Christie. Engineering by Denny King. Adventures of Doc Savage is produced and directed by Roger Rittner and is a presentation of the Variety Arts Radio Theater. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked.
One evening after the doctor had paid her a visit, Tom stopped him as he was leaving. Doctor, tell me the truth. How is she? She's very weak, Tom. Unless we can persuade her to go to the hospital within a few days, I'm afraid I won't be able to save her. I see. But you know how she is about not leaving this house until my brother Harry comes home again. No, she hasn't seen him for ten years, has she? No. She doesn't know that he's in the state penitentiary for life. For murder. It would kill her if she ever found out. I see. Well, perhaps you can get her to agree to come to the hospital just for a few days. Uh, suppose you go in and see, huh? I'll wait downstairs. All right, Doctor. I'll try. Tom? Is that you? Yes, Mother. Would you like me to close the window? No, Tom. Leave it open. It's foggy out, isn't it? Yes. You can hardly see your hand in front of your face. I like to hear the river. I've heard it every day for 30 years. For 30 years, I've watched the cliffs on the riverbank coming closer and closer as the river eats them away. Mother, I wanted to talk to you about that. Yes? It's not safe here now. We're going to have to move out of this house soon. Not till Harry comes back, Tom. He wouldn't know where to find me if we moved. Yes, he would, Mother. Please listen to me. You could... No, Tom. Not till Harry comes home. He is coming home soon. I, I know he is. I, I can see it. He'll be here soon, Tom. Then we can move. After Harry gets here. All right, Mother. I can feel him getting... Closer, closer. It won't be long now, Tom. We must be ready for it. Yes, of course. Good night, Mother. It's no use, Doctor. She has a mind made up that Harry will be here any minute. Well, oh, that's rather... Excuse me. Certainly. Hello? Yes? Speaking. Oh, hello, Sheriff. What? He did? Yes. Yes, I understand. Of course I will. Goodbye. Dr. Double Sheriff, good right. He said Harry and a companion escaped from the penitentiary early this evening by killing a guard. What? Then they stopped the motorist and took his car. The sheriff thinks they may be heading this way. Maybe that's why Mother felt Harry would be here soon. Our cast returns in a moment with a final action in tonight's story of Dr. Weird. Meantime, I'd like to ask good doctor one little question. What question, young man? Uh, do you always think of horrible, terrifying things? No. Only last evening I was out getting a bit of air. Ah, you breathe. Yes. And I saw some Adam hats. They were fine-looking hats. I walked in, tried one on. What do you think? What? I look just like a person. Well, thank you, Doctor. Gentlemen, if Dr. Weird can look just like a human being by just putting on an Adam hat, think how much a smart Adam hat can do for a normal-looking man. Seriously, I hope you'll stroll by an Adam hat store yourself sometime soon. The latest fall and winter line is in. You'll see a great variety of up-to-the-minute hats in every size, color, and style, including the Adam 5. Made a fine fur belt and only five dollars. You'll be proud to wear an Adam, and you'll be correct too. Select your favorite at any price from three forty-five to ten dollars. There are thousands of Adam hat stores and authorized dealers from coast to coast. Now, here's that man again, Doctor Weird. Now I'll finish my story. Murder comes home. After the doctor left, 
Tom remained on guard with a loaded revolver. And just after midnight... Hello, Tom. So you did come here. Uh, where else would I go? Come on, Jake. Okay. No, you can't come in. It would kill Mother. Oh, oh yes. Hmm. How is Mother? Tom? Tom? Huh, isn't that her calling now? Quiet. Yes, Mother? Tom? Is that Harry? Yes, Mother. It's Harry. Come to see you. Oh, I knew you'd come. I'll be up in a minute, Mother. Oh, well, Tom, aren't you going to ask us in? Now that she knows you're here, I have no choice. Thanks. <laughs> well, Tom, meet a pal of mine, Jake Padgett. What is this, Harry? You said we'd be safe here. This mug meets us with a gun in his head. Oh, don't worry about Tom. He'll warm up to us presently. Now, you stay here and talk to him while I run upstairs and say hello to my dear old mother. Well, Mother was so glad to see me, Tom, that you really ought to put that gun away and ask us to stay a while. Yes, Harry. Now you are going to stay until the sheriff gets here anyway. Hey, you're not going to turn us in. No. No. I told Mother I couldn't stay, that I had a long journey to make. But suppose tomorrow she learns that I've been arrested. Then what? It would kill her. But I'll see to it that she doesn't find out. And I'll see to it she does. If you turn me in, you'd kill your own mother. That won't be necessary if you'll just be reasonable. All we want is to hide here for 24 hours. I... I... No. I can't just stop outside. Probably the sheriff. Well, Tom, make up your mind. All right. Get in the closet there, both of you. I'll put the sheriff away. Uh, it's more like it. Come on. Come in. Come in. What's your sheriff? Yeah, yeah, Tom. We sure your brother someplace in the neighborhood. Thought we you might have come here. Seen any sign of him? No, not yet anyway. Uh, you never know. Want me to leave a man with you just in case? No, no, I'll be all right. I have a gun. All right, okay. I'll be back later. All right, sheriff. So long. All right, he's gone. You can come out now. Now, you're acting like a brother, Tom. Yeah, that's more like it. The sheriff said he'd be back later, though. Well, in that case, suppose I just... Take the one of yours, Tom. You can't do it, I... Now, Tom, you just do as we agreed and everything will be all right. You can't get any place in this fog tonight. So thick you can't see a foot ahead of you. But tomorrow night, they'll be off guard. You'll be able to get away. Harry, listen. Dogs. They brought a bloodhound to track us with. And they're coming this way. What do we do? It's no use hiding. If the dogs track us here, they'll know we're inside someplace. Well, that's right. Yeah, well, we'll try for it. If we can get two or three of them, we may have a chance to break through. So, Harry, listen. I've got a better idea. Oh, uh, yeah? What is it? My rowboat. You remember how we used to run the rapids when we were kids? Yeah, I remember. The boat's still there. In this fog, you could float down the river 20 miles before morning. Yeah. They'll never catch us that way. I promise they won't. You can go out the kitchen door and down the steps into the backyard. Then follow the path to the riverbank. Okay. Jake, get going. Through the kitchen there. I got this. I'm on my way. Now, Tom, I'll just take this coat of yours. Harry! I'm coming. Hurry. I hear somebody outside. Okay. Get going, Harry. I'm going. Come on, baby. Colonel, why didn't you... Well, man, what's the matter? I had to do it. I had to. That'd have killed you. What are you talking about, Tom? Harry and Jake. They were here. I told them how to escape. Through the kitchen and down the back steps to the path that leads down to the riverbank. 
to my boat. Well, they won't get away. I'm going to have wait to... Wait, wait not to let go of my arm, Tom. I'll get those two murdering rats, Sheriff. Wait, you don't understand. Shine your flashlight down there at the foot of the steps. <laughs> Great glory. There we go. Any ground at the foot of those steps. When they stepped off the last step, they had a sheer hundred foot drop to the river and the rocks down there. Well, they escaped this time right enough. From human law, anyway. <laughs> escaped all right. Even if it was in a way they didn't quite expect. And Mrs. Barnes at last agreed to move. Just in time, too. The house was nearly standing on the edge of a cliff. And it was only a month or so before another slide carried the house away completely. Do you live at the top of the cliff? If you do, you... Oh, you have to go now. Too bad. But perhaps you'll drop in again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. <laughs> This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. silent herald of life and death, success or failure, the unseen force that measures man's destiny, reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the eleventh hour. Hello? Hello! Oh, for pity's sake... Here we are, living in New York in the city with more telephones than anywhere in the world, and I can't even make a local call. You're going to be late again, buddy. Hurry, honey. Ah, uh, plenty of time. What's all the fuss? Oh, no, what's all this? What a morning. Ah, uh, it'll be the mailman, same as it is every morning around this time. You want me to get it? No, I'll manage. Your coffee's on the stove. Okay. Somebody don't burn yourself, it's hot. Oh, Mr. Ware, I'm on in this, too. I'm glad to know you're cheerful, Joe. Things are in their usual frenetic state in the warehouse all at this time. Oh, nice fat collection of mail you've got for us. Uh -huh. There must be something in this lot that's worth opening. Oh, sure there will be. Bye, Mrs. Ware. Bye. Anything uh, interesting in the mail, Helen? I can't see yet, honey, but there should be. Let's see. Uh, looks as though most of them are bills as usual, huh? <laughs> that or receipts. Well, one bill I think you must tackle, buddy, and it's the telephone. I've been trying to raise Mother all morning. Mm -hmm. Here. This looks like the only one that's for you. Mark Personal. Holding out on me? Hey, let me see that. Hey. Why? What is it, buddy? You, you look as though you've seen a ghost. What on earth is it?
What is it? What is that letter? Who is it from? Oh, it's uh, nothing, Helen, honey, really. It's just that I thought I recognized the handwriting. It, it don't mean a thing. Hey, now, wait a minute. You can't fool me like that. Come on, open it. Let's find out what's wrong. Oh, well, it may not be anything. Let's see. Hmm. Well, what is it, buddy? Well, let's see. Let's see, honey. Uh, the time has come, buddy. I swore I would kill you. And the time has come. Buddy, what does this mean? Well, you thought it would be an interesting mail, Helen, and you were right. But let me have that back. It isn't every morning that one gets a threatening letter. I'd better keep it. Buddy, this handwriting, there's been no attempt to disguise it. You recognize the writing, and you know who sent you that note, don't you? Oh, come on, honey. There's no need to get all steamed up about things like this. I've been a cop most of my life. I started off pounding the beat, now I've ended up behind a desk. During that time, I must have made a lot of enemies. Hundreds who hate my guts and thousands more who bear me a grudge. Now, just because some crazy gink starts blowing off steam... Don't practice. fool me, buddy. Bearing a grudge is one thing. Threatening to kill and not caring about having your writing recognized is quite another. Ah, oh, it's just a scare. Your record on the force proves you don't scare easy. We, we've never had any secrets from each other, buddy. If this is serious, you must tell me. You do know who it is, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I think I do, Helen. It's a guy named Dean Fabre. Dean Fabry? Uh -huh. I don't think I've ever heard you mention him. No, he belongs in the past. Well, at least I thought he did. The reason I think it's from him is because Dean was released from jail last week. He was doing a ten-year stretch, and I put him inside. I see. A crook. Connected with some guy? No. Dean isn't really a crook either. As a matter of fact, he was a cop, just like me. A cop? You mean a friend? Yeah, well, at least ways he started out to be. I guess I'd better tell you the whole story. No sense in having only half the truth. It happened years ago. There were three of us in the force who were buddies. Vic Murphy, Dean Fabry, and me. We'd started out together and been lucky enough to have stayed that way. Promotions, that kind of thing, you know. We were still in the same squad. Although I was in charge, it was only a handle. I never threw my stripes, and we always discussed everything together. I suppose it all started with the outbreak of robberies on the west side. I can remember it was Vic Murphy who first came up with the idea. The idea that there was a woman involved in the robberies. I tell you, buddy, that there's a woman at work here. What do you think, Dean? <laughs> there's always a woman. What do you mean? Is uh, Kingpin, Vic, uh, a woman organizing the jobs? Yeah, that's right. Look, it's all too slick. The places she chooses to operate in. I tell you where we've been after sent because we automatically started looking for a guy. But the guy's a dame. Huh, well, Still don't see how it's anything more than a hunch. And how are you going to prove it anyhow? Well, I figure we got to wait backwards. Start watching the fences. This is a dame. She's got several thousand bucks worth of hot ice. Sooner or later, she's going to start to offload. Then we get a lead. Come on, I'll buy you both a beer. But if I'm right... I want free drinks for a week. Hey, that'll take all our money for a month the way you down a beer, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, as it turned out, Vic was smack on right. We picked up a lead on a woman called Martha Van Buren. She was clever, had no record, you know, hard to pin anything on her. Again, it was Vic who put forward the next suggestion, and perhaps this is where things really started to go wrong. Yeah, well, Vic, it looks here like you were right, huh? But before we start paying for you to drink yourself to a standstill, what's the next move? You plant someone in their setup. Huh, easier said than done. Can be arranged. Got just the man, too. Oh? You. What? No one better. A nice-looking guy, smart, well-dressed, well-spoken. No one would ever guess you were a cop. They only got to look at me, and that's for Buddy, <laughs> Well, he's a bit behind it. Hey, come on. I'm planning to get married soon. All the more reason why you shouldn't tangle with a dangerous dame. No, it'll have to be Dean. Buy me another beer. I'll work it out for you. Well, Vic Murphy was as good as his word. Somehow he managed to get Dean Fabry introduced through parties and such like. And eventually Dean met her. By one of those strokes of luck, they liked each other immediately. And, financed by the force, Dean began to date Martha. They were seen in all the right spots. To him, she was, well, just a job. 
To her, he was a rich young man about town. It was an agreeable twosome. Of course, all the time, Dean was reporting back to the department. That dame couldn't brush her teeth without we knew about it. Then the unexpected happened. I can't believe it. I just can't. Another robbery. The Hotel Delicia. And boy, are they hopping mad. Hooked the stuff right out of the wall safe while this dame and her husband was having their dinner downstairs. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I got a fixing from the commissioner. Has Dean reported in yet? I'm expecting the call any minute now. He always rings in on the hour. Uh-huh. That'll be him now. Buddy Ware speaking. Hello there, buddy. This is Dean. Oh, let's have it, Dean. What's the news? What's with the dame? Nothing, buddy. Nothing at all. You know, we must be on the wrong tack. Martha von Burns in the clear. Mm-hmm. I was with her all evening. Stayed in her apartment, no calls, nothing. If you're hoping to fix last night's little job on Van Buren, you're wasting your time. But, Dean, that can't be. The job was identical with the others. And we're wrong about them, too. I tell you, she's got a cast iron alibi. A cop's alibi. My evidence. I can't believe it. Something's wrong somewhere. Look, I'll stick around with her for a couple more days. See what I can pick up, then I'll give you a full report. But like I say, at the moment, it looks like you're wasting your time completely. Bring you later. Bye. Bye, Dean. Well, Dean says she's in the clear. Completely innocent of the whole business. I don't believe it. She's fooling him in some way. I should be able to handle it, see through her. But I wonder. I wonder just what has gone wrong. What's the matter, Dean, honey? Can't got your tongue tonight? What? Oh, uh, sorry, Martha, honey. I'm not very good company, am I? Well, I've known you in brighter and more attractive moods. Martha, we've only known each other a short time, and this may come as a heck of a surprise to you, but I've just got to tell you, I'm quite sincere. I'm in love with you. Dean. It's true, Martha. I, I can't conceal it any longer. I have to tell you. It places me in a mighty awkward position. You see, there's something else I know, too. I know who you are, Martha. By that, I mean I know how you got your money. I know where you were last night, for instance. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. Look, Martha, now I've started, I've got to tell you everything. You've got to get away. The cops are on to you. They're watching your every move. I don't believe it. It's true. You've got to believe it because I can prove everything. Now, I love you and I'll help you all I can, but you must agree to do everything I say without questions. Now, I know it'll work, but you must listen carefully and don't interrupt me. Now... She was the far one, last one on this side. Dean. Oh, Dean, are you sure this is going to work? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. And I quit fretting. We've been over it all too many times. I've told you I'll get you out of the country, and I will. I'll never let them take you. You have no fear of that. Not when I don't trust you, Dean, I do. I don't know what's happened to us. I guess love plays tricks. What would I have done without you? That's enough, Dean. Stay right where you are. But what the... You like Vic says, Dean. I've got the lady covered. There's no getting away. It's a what? trap. You betrayed me. You made me walk right into a trap. No, no, Ma. I didn't. I swear I did. Back up, up east, Dean. Get some fresh air between you and the dame. Well, you think I'll go as easily as this, do you, Dean? I was a fool not to have seen through you. Well, I'm not Watch taken it, Vic. yet. Watch it, Vic. she got a gun from that bag. Watch it. <laughs> I didn't mean the shot to be fatal. It was all over so quickly. She she died? In hospital later. Vic had minor injuries. I'm Dean Fabry. Well, this state is mighty tough on rogue cops who turn criminal. He got ten years. As I say, his time of imprisonment is up. He's out. And it was he who sent me that threatening note on the table. How can you be sure? Well, partly because in spite of the years, I still recognize the handwriting. And because the threat is an old one. I was in court on the day he was convicted, and I can recall it like it was yesterday. You killed her! You, buddy, where? You're a murderer! I'll get you one day. I'll get you. I'll kill you like I killed her. I'll kill. You hear me? I'll kill you.
Well, Helen, darling, that's the story. When you think about it, that letter couldn't have come from anyone else, could it? No. No, I guess not. Oh, buddy, I'm scared. No reason to be, honey. It's one thing to make a threat and another to carry it out. But you're in danger. Oh, everyone in my job is to some extent. Ah, no, Helen. Don't look so scared or I'd wish I'd never told you. What do we do? I know what I do. I go to work as usual. But stopping here to tell you all this really means I'm going to be late. Will they give you some sort of protection, buddy? Protection? Well, now, how can they do that? You did your duty by the state. Seems to me a great pity that the state can't do its duty by you and keep this Dean Fabry away. I, I mean, trace him. Warn him that, that he's not to come near you. Well, maybe I don't want protection. You said yourself that I don't scare easy. Okay, it's a shock to know that Dean is out and still feels the same way he did ten years ago. But I don't see that's any reason why I should hide myself away from him. But if he's a killer? Well, I don't think Dean is capable of killing. I don't see why he should be given the chance of proving that. And anyway, I don't understand. If you and he uh, and this guy, Vic Murphy, were such buddies, where did he suddenly fall out with you? I mean, it's just crazy. It doesn't make sense whatever way you look at it. In an odd sort of way, it makes sense from Dean's side. He fell in love with Martha Van Buren and I killed her. He must have been very much in love to have risked his whole career. I think he always liked and respected Vic and me, but he knew we'd never go along with his aiding and abetting the escape of a jewel thief. You know what love's like. It, it can make folk do some strange things, make some odd sacrifices, huh? I wonder if I do know that. I wonder how great a sacrifice I'd make. Oh, I don't think I'd let down my friends. Oh, oh honey, honey, please, I, I don't want you to go to the office today. Can't you tell them you're not feeling well? Here you'll be safe. Oh, now, Helen, get a grip on yourself. I can do that. In any case, we've got no telephone, remember? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have let go. You've got quite enough on your mind without coping with an hysterical wife. I'm sorry. Ah, oh, forget it, honey. Now, look, I really must be going. I'll ring you from the office just to set your mind at rest. Oh, that phone again. Now, oh, don't worry. Look, I'll call the complaints and get the thing fixed. But don't stay on the line all day talking to your mother. All right, buddy. Anything you say. <laughs> hey, who's your best boy? Oh, buddy. Buddy, darling. Please be careful. I will. You know, we could be doing just what Dean Fabray wants us to do. This is a war of nerves, so make sure you keep yours, huh? Now, come on. Walk with me to the garage. Come on, now. Yes? Oh, excuse me, ma'am. This is the house that's got trouble with the telephone, 36A. Oh, oh, yes. I've been expecting you. I didn't realize you were from the telephone company. Please come in. Thanks. Been looking for this place for some time. Crazy type numbering. Yeah, it is a bit confusing if you don't know the district. Uh, did you receive a complaint from my husband? I've been expecting you all day. Oh, I don't know who placed the complaint, lady. I was just given the job. Where's the phone? Well, through here in the study. It's over there on the desk. There are points in the kitchen, lounge, and hall... But none of them works. Uh, none of them, huh? Well, what about the bedroom? Oh, there is a point there, but it's rarely used. I, I used to move at the phone in there when my husband was on night duty, but now, well, it, his job's changed a bit. Huh. Come up in the world, huh? Do you uh, think the fault can be anything serious? Well, I can't answer that lady till I've been over everything, can I? Oh, no. Oh, no, of course not. I, I'm sorry. What's the matter? You seem kind of nervous. Something the matter? Oh, no. Oh, no, of course not. Oh, please, go right ahead. If there is anything you want, then just let me know. Okay. Uh, anyone else around? I mean, uh, servants in the house? No, not now. The cleaning woman left at lunchtime. I, I'm not very practical about mechanical things, but if I can be of any help, I... I, I guess I can handle it. Uh -huh. That's dead, okay? Abo. Why? Oh, usually there's some kind of connection. You know, a, a crackle, a faint sound, even before the tone comes on. This is real dead. Like someone might have cut the wires. Cut the wires? Oh, no. Nasty, huh? Yeah, it's dead, all right. Nasty word, dead. Something so final about it, isn't there? Dead. What? Why did you do that? No need to be jumping, Mrs. Ware. It is Mrs. Ware, isn't it? Yes. 
Yes, of course. What time is your husband due back? What has my husband got to do with this? Wait a minute. The line is cut. You are from the telephone company, aren't you? Mm, nice place you have here. Yep, I'm up in the world. I huh? said you are from the telephone company, aren't you? Now, what do you think, Mrs. Ware? I think your name is Dean Fabry. Am I right? So, you know, do you? And it's true. Sure. Sure, it's true. Why should I fool you? No point, is there? Why have you come here? Now, look. You say you know about me. If that's so, if you've been discussing me with your husband, then you must know why I am here. I, I don't believe this. I mean, you, you didn't send that letter to Buddy, did you? Do I seem to you the sort of man who would make idle threats? If I know Buddy... He will have either told you nothing or everything. I can't believe this. The whole day has a, has a, has a nightmare quality about it. it. It can't be happening. Mr. Fabry, you, you must go. Just go. I won't say anything to anyone if you quit this house now. No. Oh, I can't stand this. It's just plain crazy. I can't stand it. You can't stand it. You want me to go? You are an out like a common servant. I've been inside for ten long years. Don't you understand that? So what? Whose fault was that? No one but your own. And how do you expect me to treat you? You get out of prison and write my husband a stupid hysterical note, trick your way in here and try to scare me to death. What attitude am I supposed to take? One of sympathy? Well, don't expect it from me. Anyone who turns his back on law and order like you is worthy only of contempt and loathing. Now get out! <laughs> I have to hand it to Buddy. You always could pick him. I should have known he'd find himself a worthy woman. Unlike you, were hoodwinked by a common criminal. <gasps> you shouldn't have said that, Mrs. Ware. You shouldn't have said it. What? What are you going to do? You know full well what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill Buddy. You'll try to kill him. Yes. Yes, I suppose you will. In your twisted mind, the so-called wrong has grown over the years. You're now so bitter, you can't think straight. I can understand it. This is where all forms of imprisonment go wrong. Oh, Mr. Fabry. Dean. Can't you try to recall the days when you and Buddy worked in harmony on the force? Can't you try to see the other side? You've made good the wrong. Don't insist on staying a criminal. We'll help you. I promise. Both Buddy and I will do our best to help you. Help you get over it all. The soft approach. Appeal to the man's better instincts. Use feminine wiles. It won't work, Mrs. Ware. I have no better instincts. Buddy thinks you have. He says you couldn't kill even if you wanted to. You'll find out how wrong he is. I've had ten years. Ten years in which you should have seen the truth. Martha Van Buren was an expert operator in her own field. You can only recall the sordid affair you had with her. She probably had a dozen attractive men on a string. Shut up! Want to strike me again? That won't alter facts. You may have been stupid enough to have loved her. I doubt very much if she cared a snap of the fingers about you. That isn't true. She would have stayed with me. Be your age. You've been haunted by the thought that she wouldn't have stayed with you even if you had got her away on that ship. It would have been somewhere else to live, some other person's jewels to steal. Some other young man to you. No. No, it wasn't like that. I know. I know inside of me that Martha loved me as deeply as I loved her. But she wasn't given the chance to prove it. She was shot down. Killed. No one gave her a chance to explain. As Buddy gave me the story, there was an opportunity to give herself up. She resisted arrest. Why, she was actually armed. So what? She was prepared for a showdown, prepared to shoot her way out. That doesn't fit with a picture you're trying to paint for me. She didn't shoot to kill. Neither did Buddy. She could have killed. He would have wounded. She could have gone to the chair for murder. Would you have felt the same as you do if that had been so? Buddy was doing his duty. Duty? That word no longer means anything to you, does it? You haven't got the meaning of it for over ten years. Not since that woman, Martha Van Buren, cast some sort of spell over you. A spell which made you forget what duty and honor mean. Be quiet. Why? Because the truth hurts. I said quiet. Or I'll use this on you. Oh, God. You should have known. 
How else can I do what I have to do without this? Perhaps I was wrong. Perhaps Buddy is too. Perhaps we thought of you as basically the old Dean Fabry. You may have changed. Become ill. Mad. Why do you keep looking at that clock in the out of the window? Oh, yeah. Nearly 5.30. It's time for him to come home. Buddy was always reliable. A creature of habit. He's due back at any minute, isn't he? Isn't he? Yes. Yes, he is. Then we must get the reception committee ready for him. You, you really are mad. You can't recall things as they should be. Only one fact is present in your mind. Martha is dead. The crazy, twisted logic that Buddy spoke of. Justice. That's how you think of it, isn't it? Got it at last, haven't you? That's the way it is. No. No, it isn't. Look. Can't you see that if anything happens to Buddy, I'll be the one who suffers? Too bad. Can't be helped. He's getting his... But you don't understand. It isn't as if Buddy planned to kill you. He didn't plan to kill anyone. It was just unfortunate that he happened to cause the death of someone who was... Well, it was all the world to you. They'll be coming up the driveway soon. I'll hear the car. Please. Please listen to me. I. I. I'm all the world to Buddy. What? What are you talking about? If Buddy comes in here in a few minutes' time and finds me dead and you gone, then you really will have your revenge, won't you? And that way he'll suffer as you have. You'll have killed the woman he loved in the same way that he killed your woman. It's, it's the only way you can really get even. Let me die. Not him. <laughs> you call me crazy. I, I can't live without car's turning into the drive. Please. Please. Listen to me. I... Do as I say. Uh, I, I can't hurt you. W why should I? You've got to. If one of us must die, it mustn't be him. I love him too much. Give me that gun. Give it to me. I told you fool. Let go. here on the floor. You, you must have fainted. Buddy. Buddy, it was Dean. Dean Fabry. Yeah, I know. I didn't see him. He must have gone out the back way, but I found this revolver on the kitchen table together with this note. A note? Yeah, scribbled. The same handwriting. Here, read it. I still hate you. But she loves you. It's the only thing that saved you. Oh, buddy, perhaps there, perhaps there is hope for him, even yet. I think so. He's not a killer, and you must have proved that to him, huh? Buddy. Oh, buddy. Oh, come on now. Who's your best boy, huh? The makers of Bayer Aspirin, Insto Eye Drops, and Philips Tablets invite you to join them again next Tuesday night at 7.30 as the moment of destiny approaches in the 11th hour. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio